Coming up next, The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy. Every Thursday from 4 p.m. right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. People are struggling to have conversations and connect with others that they don't completely agree with on every topic. And I think that's probably the biggest problem that we need to try and solve is how after all this division and after all this separation, do we end up bringing people together again? And what does unity really look like? New Zealand faces some pretty big issues. First one is COVID in the aftermath. There's no getting away from that. Second is racial division. It's being ginned up and it's dangerous. Another issue that maybe people haven't got their head around yet is digital currency. What form does that take? Is it programmable? Will it be used to manipulate behaviour and patterns of behaviour? Those questions need to be asked and answered. How can you have fair, open, democratic government by people who are appointed? It's a ridiculous idea. And if that idea is taken to its zenith, then this country is in real trouble because democracy, one person, one vote, where every vote is of equal value, has got to be the foundation of a modern New Zealand. What's true, what's not true, how our kids are to be educated. And, you know, I have a great fear for the future. I think we know from history where this could end up. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy, right here on RCR. Welcome to The Crunch on Reality Check Radio. I'm your host, Cam Slater, and this is the place where we crunch the political issues and cut through the spin and the PR. We have another incredible show ahead for you this week. My first guest this afternoon is Ashley Church. We'll be discussing his interview on RCR with Rodney Hyde and then sharing how his faith now colours his thinking on politics, polarisation and his thoughts on the coming election campaign. Then I'll be talking with comrade Matt McCartan, an expert in the dark arts of politics and a hard-bitten unionist who I've always had a good working relationship with. We'll discuss what drives him in politics his involvement in the 2014 Labour Party campaign and dirty politics, along with an assessment of some current political issues. And this week we've seen yet more violent crime and gangs taking over the streets for yet another funeral. I'll talk to Nationals' Mark Mitchell about what his party's going to do to solve New Zealand's growing crime problem. It's a busy afternoon and we have a lot to get through, but I can sneak in some of your feedback here on RCR. And finally, I'll get my buddies on the line to talk about Labour's new climate infrastructure fund they've created with their cosy pals at BlackRock. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater, right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio. Welcome back to The Crunch here on RCR with Cam. It's election time, so get ready for the promises, the lies, the innuendo, the charades, and most importantly, the shell game. The media are part of the shell game. You know the game where there's a pea under one of three walnut shells? It's a scam, where all the power is in the hands of the game master as he shuffles those shells around, confounding and confusing the poor fool who thought he could outwit the game master. Politics, particularly during elections, is just like a shell game. The P is the promise you listen to. The walnut shells are the reasons they give you for not delivering up the P, the promise. It's all a con, and every election you get played. Worse still, you fall for the shell game every single time. The politicians, just like the confidence trickster, are laughing at you, the voter. They're saying under their breath, here comes another mark. You may think I'm being cynical, but I've been doing this politics gig since when I was in nappies. Every party and every politician plays the shell game with voters. 
But the very worst party at this shell game is the Labour Party. Look at all the headline promises of the last six years of the Ardern Hipkins regime. And then look at the delivery. Where are the 100,000 affordable homes they promised with Kiwi Build? Where are the billion trees they were going to plant? Where's the rapid rail to Hamilton and Tauranga? Where's the light rail to the airport or even Mount Roskill? Where's the bike bridge across Auckland Harbour? And where is the elimination of child poverty? Now they're shuffling the walnut shells again, promising us the earth. This time it's five tunnels under the harbour and a cost of tens of billions of dollars. This mob couldn't build a house if they were sitting in a room full of Lego. They haven't laid a single millimetre of track to the airport or to Tauranga. Children are still living in the same crappy houses, going to the same crappy schools, living in poverty. And who knows how many trees have been planted. These clowns haven't delivered a single major policy. But they sure knew how to subjugate us, stomp all over our rights, divide our society, and turn us against each other. Now they're playing the shell game again, making huge promises that they will never deliver. And in three years, they'll do it all again. The power to stop this is with each of us. We need to say no to the games. We need to vote for reality. We need to give the politicians a reality check. That's why I'm here on Reality Check Radio, so you can be better informed about what these charlatans are up to. They think we won't notice what they're up to, but we are awake to their games, and now we get to show them just how awake we are to their shell game. Ashley Church is well known as the property guy and a favourite amongst RCR listeners. He's a former candidate for the National Party, but he wants to talk politics today. I thought I'd get him on to the show after listening to him and Rodney Hyde talking about his faith and his journey to discover that faith. Ashley, welcome to the show. Welcome to The Crunch. Thanks, mate. <laughs> hey, look, Thank you. I wanted to reach out and have a chat with you because I listened to your interview with Rodney Hyde the other day, and you were talking about the impact Jesus Christ has had on your life and, and your Christian faith. Yep. And yep. I don't really really want to talk about the specifics of that because it, it just triggered in my mind that your approach to politics now or you know, the political life has probably been colored a lot by your faith. And I'm interested to explore a little bit of that and some of the things that we're witnessing now in society. Absolutely. And, yes. and, and you're, you're right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it really touched me that interview with Rodney. And, you know, I can see Rodney's grappling with some really big issues. And you and I seem to have sort of hit our stride um, with our faith at about the same time. And we've had some challenges in our lives. And our faith is our grounding point now. Yeah, absolutely. So so for me, it's been a battle of about 40 years. I mean, I've been nominally a Christian since I was about 18, but it's been, mm. but like you, it's something I've sort of really sort of come to terms with in terms of what it means for me just in the last two or three years in particular. And it's interesting because you're right, it's completely transformed my life in respect of all sorts of things, including, as, as, as you quite correctly say, uh, my, my attitude to, to politics and how the country should be run. Yeah, you once stood for the National Party, didn't you? Oh, when I was a baby, yeah, when I was a nanny back in, <laughs> back in 1987 in the middle of the uh, the Rogernomics reforms and the seat that uh, couldn't possibly have been won by anybody but Labour. But it was it was an interesting period, and I went on from there to stand for the, the City Council in Napier a couple of years later and bolted in based on name recognition. So, um, yeah, went, went down that track a long time ago. Would you Would you consider yourself to be a natural... National Party person now? No, no. If you'd asked me that question twenty years ago, I would have said yes. Now I'm a natural conservative, so my vote goes where with the party that has, has the most conservative uh, political positions on the the issues that matter to me. Which means that I'm not, I can't be taken for granted as a national voter in the way I might have been able to be twenty years ago. That's the that's the problem with these big political parties, isn't it? Though, Ashley, that. They take voters for granted. They take their support for granted. They do. They do. They do. It, it, it's interesting in respect of national too, because because I haven't changed, and I suspect you probably haven't politically either. But it's the national party that's changed. It's changed substantially over the last twenty years, in particular, and it's and it's moved 
and I understand why it's done it. I understand the politics of it, but it's moved more and more to the centre and then over to the centre left um, in an effort to, to to sort of mop up as many of those votes from the centre as possible. In the process of doing that, it's closed out people on the, uh, on the, I wouldn't say the extreme right, but more to the right of the National Party that once would have been part of the traditional rump of that party. And you saw that in particular with um, with the, 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 the pandemic and some of the stuff that took part there. And you're seeing that now it's, it's manifesting itself in the formation of these little splinter parties that are really people who, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, would have been natural supporters of National. Yeah, I mean, yeah, people say to me, oh, you've left, the, you know, you've left the National Party. And I always say, no, the National Party left me. I left you. Yeah, totally, but, totally. But, I, I feel exactly the same. Because if you look at the founding principles of the National Party, I still subscribe to those. It's a small government, individual responsibility, protecting private property yep. rights. And we've got this woke, wet, sort of dripping National Party that people <laughs> think are, are Tories or think they're right wing. But you mentioned it. You said they're centre left. And I agree with you on that. I don't think the National Party's e- even remotely conservative in any way. No. That's been a transition, Cam. It's, it's, dur- yeah. During Key's era, um, I would argue that that was, that was done for political reasons. It was done because Key saw itself, saw the National Party as, as, as a sort of an all-encompassing machine which looked to take as much of the vote as it possibly could, and they did that for reasons that were designed to keep uh, centre-left voters in the camp. But over the last few years, it's almost as if they've taken that on as their new mantle. So that's now who they are. It's no longer done for political reasons. It's good to, and you only have to look at the voting record of quite a large number of the members of that current caucus to see that that's actually who they are, certainly in terms of their, their, their attitude towards moral issues. Yeah, well, that's one thing that Helen Clark was very successful at doing, is moving the Overton window firmly to the left and dragging yep. you know, the National Party across with them uh, in order to compete. Yep. And um, that's yep. one thing I admire about her is her ability to influence and change New Zealand to being more left-wing than it was previously. Yeah. Interestingly, that's not always a bad thing. I mean, if you go back to the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and look at some of the what would have been regarded as, as conservative or traditional values back then, which were borderline racist, and, yeah. and were probably misogynist. That stuff, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I'm completely supportive of what's happened in that space. And to the extent that that's had an impact on the National Party and right-wing parties around the world, it's been a good thing. But it's some of the other stuff. It's the stuff around abortion on demand um, and some of this wokery around uh, identity politics and stuff, which, which is not about human rights. It's about basically, it's about pursuing an agenda which is foreign to anything that we recognise as Kiwis. That's the stuff I'm grappling with. Yeah, it's, it's policing language and thought through totally, totally. Finger, finger wagging and tut tutting, isn't it? Really? <laughs> yeah, granny state or nanny state. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Um, you mentioned in in I, I looked through your website and I I found an article yep. that you'd written that said that you really struggled with sales and um, you, you mentioned a couple <laughs> of books. Now I've read those books and um, I've I've yep. done some of those courses and I even. Uh, you know, invested in Brian Tracy's um, sales programs, and it actually made yeah, me yeah. a great salesperson. Now, you're in that article. You're talking about your sales job uh, on your faith and how you really struggle with that. But I listen, you know, listen to that interview with Rodney Hyde, and I reckon you've got your sales pitch just right. <laughs> it, it's interesting because when I wrote that, and that was about nine months ago, I, I was still transitioning. That's a terrible word to use now, given its new meaning. <laughs> yeah. But I was still. <laughs> I was still going. I was still going through this sort of process, this osmosis process in my mind, where I was trying to work out exactly where that sat. So the point of that article that you're referring to was, um, I was saying that when I was young, because I used to have sales roles when I was young yeah, before I sort yeah. of found my stride in my career, um, that I was a shocking salesperson, and that, uh, and and I was shocking for two reasons: one, because I I, I didn't like rejection, and the other reason was because I was lazy. And, and so I found it difficult to sort of sustain an interest in selling stuff. And I was comparing that to my faith and saying I found it very difficult to talk about my faith and using that kind of as a springboard mm. to make the, have that conversation. It's interesting, though, over the last few months as I've sort of become increasingly of the view that, well, you know what? It actually doesn't matter what other people think. Because it, it, that, that fear that I might have had in a sales role where I was selling insurance or, you yeah. know, 
computers or whatever it was I was selling at the time. That doesn't apply to my faith because you either take it or leave it. And, and also the other thing I think that changes too is I'm old and ugly now. You know, I, w- I was a young guy back then and I was still trying to sort of impress people and, yeah. and, and maintain a certain... Um, that, 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 none of that matters to me now. I've done all that. I've, I've had that part of my career. Now I've, I've got the view that I've got certain things I need to achieve before I die and, and, and I'll do them to the best of my ability and if people don't like it, well, that's tough luck. Yeah, it's kind of the same position that I've ended in, you know, except I, I had a very close run with dying. Uh, and I'm lying there in the hospital bed thinking, yeah, I dodged that bullet. What am I going to do now and what I've got left? And, you know, totally, it totally focuses your mind. And um, but but I see it as a, a sale, sales training. I mean, I've always said to politicians who have asked me how they can get into you know politics, how they can. I said, well, you need to learn how to sell. Because if you don't know how to sell, how are you going to sell yourself and how are you going to sell your ideas? And yep. uh, and faith is exactly the same thing. And maybe, you know, we need to form a little sales training team that uh, can go out there <laughs> to teach people how to sell their faith better. Because yeah. I think we do a bad job at it sometimes. <laughs> the, the other thing, and I don't know whether this is personal to me or it's something everybody can learn from, but the thing I've learned too, and again, it just comes back to age and experience, is I tend to find now that I can use little, par- I'll call them parables, but just little things that have happened in my life. Yeah. And they're kind of little openings. You can use them as examples and then you segue into the stuff you really want to say. So rather than just sort of jumping on people and hitting them between the eyes, it's about using experiences to draw upon where you can actually, and they're life experiences that people can actually associate with or, or, or are familiar with that then lead into this other stuff. And I'm not quite good at that. I do it both in my writing and my speaking, and I'd like to think that's, you know, that part and parcel of the journey I've gone through. Well, you know, it's kind of biblical as well because you look at all the parables, yeah. um, you know, I, and the stories right. of the apostles and you look at even uh, Paul's change from Saul to Paul on yeah. the road to yeah. Damascus, you know, and their, their life story, I mean, that that covers a hardened killer. You know, he yeah. he um, he went out there and persecuted Christians uh, and then became one himself. Uh, and then used that to, you know, perhaps become one of the greatest storytellers in the Bible. Totally, totally. It's interesting, though, Cam, because you, you you mentioned a couple of minutes ago people approaching you and saying, how can I get into politics? And I almost think that's the wrong question. I mean, I understand the question because it's a question I would have asked myself when I was younger. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but for me, politics should be about being taken, kicking and screaming into it. It should be about people right. who don't want to necessarily do it but, but are drawn to it because because they've got something to offer and something to add and something to contribute to the country. But that's not what we've got with the current crop right across the house. We've got people who are there because they see it as a career or they see it as an ego thing or a status thing. And it, it, and that's not unique to New Zealand. That's right throughout the Western world. And it just gets the wrong result. It gets the wrong, the wrong sort of people and the wrong result ultimately for your nation. Well, I mean, that, that's absolutely right. And that's actually what I counsel, depending on the age of them, if they're quite young, like, and when I say quite young, I, I think under 40 now is young. And yep. uh, and I say to them, you know, especially when they're like in their 20s, how do I get into politics? Hang on, you haven't lived. You don't know anything. You think you do, yep. but you, do, you actually don't. You need another 20 years of yep. working, you know, to to get some life's chal- some of life's challenges out of the way. Because uh, life is hard, and if you're you know twenty something, you're going into par- into parliament. People are going to be looking to you to provide solutions, but you haven't even lived. Well, with all due respect to her, and I don't mean to offend anybody, but but that that perfectly sums up Jacinda Ardern. Mm. I've got no doubt that Jacinda Ardern had had twenty years on it. She probably would have made a, big, a good prime minister. As it as it happens. She'll go down in history as the worst prime minister this country's ever had, the most, certainly the most incompetent. And that I think that's purely a reflection of the fact that she just got that job way too young in her life um, and, and needed more experience and more time and the ability to actually balance decisions rather than apply ideology in the way that she did. So that, that's a perfect example of what you're talking about. But there are lots of those people that get in there without having had a Eric of real life experience. If they've had a job at all, it's been in the public service in a lot of cases. Who 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 think that they've got some ability to be able to tell people how to live their lives? It's the wrong way to do things. Oh, totally. You know, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions, though, paved isn't with it? Good intentions. Yeah. 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 And totally. Jacinda Ardern is, is. You know, I used to think she was a nice person, but you know, somewhat wonky in her thinking. 
until we had the, the pandemic. And then I came to the conclusion that actually, out of all the politicians over all the years that I've met, and I've been involved in politics all my life, so you know, I'm 55 this year, I've met hundreds of them. Uh, I know them intimately. And she's the one person that I, of all those politicians, and everyone can have different views on them, but of all the politicians I met, she's the one person who I actually think was evil because of the actions yeah, that she I, did. I understand that point, and I know a lot of people share it. I'm not quite sure I would go that far, only only because when I look at the, the, the way that she responded to things, I recognized a lot of myself in terms of... So I had some pretty strong ideological views when I was young, and they were yeah. views that I genuinely believed, and they're, and they're views that I, I don't hold at all now, but yep. their views that I genuinely believed at the time were the, the right solution. And, and if I think about how I might have applied those, were I in a position to do so? I'm not sure I would have done it all that differently to the way that she did. They were different policies, obviously, but it's this blind belief in your own, this hubris, this blind belief in your own rightness and the fact that if only people would do things the way that you believe that they should be done, that the world would be a better place. And I guess, and maybe I'm naive, but I guess there's an aspect of that with her, in my view, with her, I'm thinking, I don't know that she was necessarily evil, but I do think she was absolutely driven by A, lack of experience, B, incompetence, and C, this massive ideology which drove everything that she actually did. And that actually got worse. That doubled down, I think, because she was surrounded by people who supported it. Um, and also the result of the 2020 election, which I think she read as a massive endorsement of her when in fact all that was, and you saw it right around the Western world, was a lot of people basically saying, we just want to be safe, we don't want any change. Um, and so, I, But I think she read that as a huge endorsement and that she, she almost started to double down after that point and actually get worse because she thought that there was this huge support for what she was doing and therefore she was untouchable. Um, evil, don't know. Time will tell. History will be interesting when it judges what she did. Well, it's, it's, I, I mean, I wrote an article about that uh, on the BFD called The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, and I explained why yeah. I came to that. And it came down to you know, she professed to be this epitome of kindness, and then she, you know, she said and did things that showed that underneath her and the people who supported her, and Chris Hipkins is one of those, were yeah. addicted to power and absolute tyrants, and used the pandemic to make profound changes to New Zealand society, where they pitted uh, mate against mate, family against family. They, you know, uh, othered people. They, uh, you know, this is supposed to be, uh, she's supposed to be a politician that's inclusive. And then everything she did was about exclusivity. So if you didn't take the vaccine, you were going to be excluded from society. The yep. race relations landscape in New Zealand was has has significantly eroded from where we were yep. at, you know, under uh, over many many years. It's now, I think it's been set. I think race relations in New Zealand have been set back fifty years by like her complete, government. Maybe not fifty, but for certainly for a long time. Yeah, I agree. I and, agree. And it's interesting because for sorry, carry on. No, no, no. It's okay. Well, no, I was just going to say, because you say all that, and I agree with you completely, and I looked at the polls for a long time, um, certainly over the last 18 months, stubbornly staying up at around 36, 37%, and I could never understand that, because I, was, I, I, I looked at those and I'd think, are these people seeing the same New Zealand that I'm seeing? Not just mm. in respect of race relations mm. and the division that she created, but also just in respect of all of the measures of, of uh, against the things that they claimed that they were going to achieve, whether you're talking about housing or health statistics or poverty or all that other stuff that they, they claimed they were going to do, where they had failed, 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 basically in everything that they had done. And yet those poll numbers were still stubbornly staying up, getting close to 40, which did my head in. I, I couldn't understand. It's be, be coming down now, I see, and, I, and some polls are coming down as I was 26, 27, which is, which is probably still too high in my view. But, but but finally, the country's starting to see. But for a long time, those things that you're quite correctly highlighting didn't seem to be resonating with the average Kiwi. They just didn't seem to get that we were in such bad shape and respect of all this stuff. Well, that, I mean, I put that down to a combination of uh, Stockholm Syndrome and, uh, right. and, and Pavlov's dogs. And uh, Yeah, you know, you're probably right. People just got used to having been told what to do. And we saw this the other day, you know, uh, there was a – a, a fire alarm at Eden Park at one of the World Cup games. And they had this guy on TV saying, I, the alarm was going off and 
and I couldn't find anybody who would tell me what to do. And I, was, <laughs> I, I sat there and I thought, you're a Labour voter. Yeah. <laughs> you're stubbornly yeah. stuck I, in I it because you want to be told what to do. Yeah, I had a conversation with Paul Brennan a few weeks back on uh, on your station, and we were talking about this. And I made the comment to him that if uh, if if, if Adern in one of our one pm stand ups during COVID had come out and said, um, in order to combat COVID, we require everybody to to if you're out in public to wear a uh, a um, a polka dot onesie. Uh, I guarantee the following day, probably 20% of the population would have been out there proudly supporting their polka dot onesie because they and, were being and, told to do that. Yeah, and there would have been, uh, you know, uh, news reports of uh, fights breaking out at the warehouse um, over polka dot onesies. Yeah, yeah. And people being dogged in for not wearing it. I mean, yeah. that, that was how ridiculous it got. It was There, there was no empirical analysis of why we were doing these things. It was coming from the, you know, the 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 the, the uh podium the, the of, truth. of truth and the podium of truth, yeah. And and that was the end of it. And that that was the part I found so hard to understand from a fellow Kiwis, because we're normally pretty decent, reasonable people and we're pretty sensible. Common sense went out the window with a lot of people during that period. Well I think part of the problem is in New Zealand we've got a large, very large percentage of the population who's mantra in life is go along to get along and yeah yeah it, it's um i think that actually caused a lot of the problems you know, i had people saying to me oh come on cam do the right thing i said oh and i'd say to them well what is the right thing who said it's the right thing i said oh well you know jacinda i don't said it i said hang on that's the leader of the yeah. labor party when you, since when have you ever listened to anything that a leader of the labor party has ever said and now yeah. Yeah. you're saying we need to get go along to get along Stuff that. Yeah. I'm not doing that. Yeah. It was, I, I completely agree. It was a weird, weird period. It was interesting. I saw a, um, I saw a meme a few months back that sort of the, 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 the nonsense of this, and I think it said something along the lines, I've got, I've got a headache, so I'm taking a Panadol to help my community. And it was, it was, <laughs> that, was, that was essentially what was going on. It was this nonsense that was being fed to us that we were believing because we were being told it by somebody who we thought was in a position to know. We weren't really thinking about what that stuff actually meant. I'm not, by the way, I'm not a conspiracist, so I don't buy into a lot of the stuff on the right around, you know, vaccines and COVID and stuff. There may have been some truth to some of that, but I think generally I think there was an overreaction. But I can understand where that stuff came from. It was a reaction to some of the nonsense that was being peddled and that we were being told around the justification for some of the measures that were being taken. Never before has our public health legislation been turned on its head, pulled inside out and used in a way that it was never designed to do. I mean, you know, the isolation rules applied to people who had transmissible diseases um, themselves, not the whole population. You know, it was designed to, if you've got, you know, uh, smallpox, for example, then we're going to isolate you and the immediate people in your house and everyone else can get on with their lives. They turned that on its head and and said, we're going to lock you all up so you don't catch this thing. And yep. we were just, uh, you know, it was nonsensical. And then I'm sitting there thinking, does any, has anybody not learnt anything from history? You know, we are seeing no. here a masterclass in propaganda that's probably making, you know, Joseph Goebbels sit there, clap his hands and do a little sort of jig that, yes, my my strategies have worked, <laughs> you know. Yep. Where, where you and I might disagree, I gave us a lot of thought over sort of that period between 2000 and t- late 2020 and 2021. I guess where we might differ, and I differ with a lot of people who probably, is I, I, I think that that first, say, nine months, maybe 12 of lockdown, I kind of get that. And I'll tell you why I get it, because, because when this thing first hit in early 2020, there were... Uh, there were, I was going to say predictions, but there were, there were some specialists saying, hey, this could be as bad as the Spanish flu. Now, I don't know if you know much about the history of the Spanish yeah, flu in 2018. Yeah. yeah, so it, it killed 7% of the world's population. So if uh, COVID had been as bad as that, that you were talking half a billion people that would have died. And in, in the absence of knowing whether it was going to be that bad or not, I kind of get the original lockdowns. I understand that. I think it was, and I, and I think National would have probably done the same thing. Where I differ with the government is once the figures started to come through, once the mortality numbers started to come through, and that was late 2020, early 2021, and the mortality rates were, and, and this is this is a fact, Cam, mortality rates were about one one hundredth 
yep. of the Spanish flu. I think there exactly. was there was six million died worldwide versus half a billion, which would have been the number had it had it been at the same level as the Spanish flu. At that point, that was the point for governments around the world to say this thing isn't nearly as bad as we anticipated. It's basically just a bad flu. We need to open things up again as quickly as possible and get life back to normal. Yep. And she didn't. She actually doubled down. She actually made it. That was the point where the country should have said, "Hey, hang on, this isn't good. This, this isn't right." But we didn't. We just continued to go along with it. Well, and you know, we had Auckland locked down for one case, you know, for for months on end. Yeah. And now, you, yep. you know, every day there's thousands of cases in the community. God knows why there is. But are people still testing? You know, it, is it a thing? But it's the flu. It's a bad flu. Exactly. We but were. Very, yeah, I'm very clearly of that opinion now. It's a bad flu. It's a little bit worse. If you look at some of the other flus over the last 20 years, the mortality rates are a little higher, but not, not appreciably. But if you're fit, um, and, if and you're fit and healthy and eat well and got got, you know, fine, yeah. then you're fine. If you're yep. if you're fat, old, and um, got a whole lot of other things, well, things are a little bit more difficult for you. But that's life. You made your choices. Yep. By the way, the argument I get from people when I put what I just said to them is they'll say, "Oh, well, the reason that it was only six million is because we had these medication measures and we had vaccination." Rubbish. So my argument to that is, I know it is rubbish. And so let me, so my argument to that is, well, let's say the mortality rate has been twice what it was. Let's say if we hadn't had those measures, it had been twice what it was. It was still tiny yeah. by comparison to the reason we went into it. The reason we went into it is because there was a fear that it could kill half a billion people worldwide. That was, people forget that. That was the rationale. It, yeah. it wasn't, a, it was one one hundredth of that. Um, uh, it, the, 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 the measures just didn't stack up. And that what people forget too is that, that rationale came from uh, a scientist in the UK with a track record of making appalling chicken little sky is falling um, <laughs> type predictions that never come true. Yep. And yet everyone bought yep. into that. All of our modeling that was done, we had, oh no, we need to trust the science. We've got these data modelers. And uh, if you looked into the data model that they all used here in New Zealand, they didn't reinvent the wheel. They actually took the wonky wheel off that guy at the Imperial College yeah. and brought it into here and extrapolated fanciful yeah. numbers that, that weren't even remotely close to where we were going to end up. Yeah, that is a tough one, though, because what if it had gone the other way? What if it had been, you know, it's easy for me to be wise in hindsight, but what if it had been uh, much more serious than it was? And, that, and that's why I say there's an aspect of this that I understand. I do understand the initial, the initial mitigation measures. It's, not, it's what they did subsequent to that that I have a real problem with. And then, you know, and, and probably going up the ground you talk a lot about, but then with the, the parliamentary protests uh, where, and, and, and don't get me wrong, I didn't necessarily agree with a lot of what was being protested there, but people asking legitimate questions, Kiwis protesting, in a way, civil youth protesting in a way that they're entitled to do, and the way that, that was treated, not just by the way by by Labour, who who were appalling in their treatment of the protesters, but even by the National Party, even by the National. I mean, all Luxon needed to do was to go down and talk to those people and say, look, I don't necessarily agree with you, but I'm here to listen. And, and he would have won massive accolades from the country. Instead, he chose to take the lead of a prime minister who'd who'd lost any sense of who she was, and and was acting like a dictator. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's the one thing that you know I cannot abide of both the ACT Party and the National Party was that unwillingness yep. to talk. And and that's yep. you know, that's one of the reasons why when I was asked to come on uh reality check radio and host a show, is that I you know, I felt that you know, in the changes in my life and things like that, that we'd lost the ability to talk to people. We've got yep. this polarization and, and segregation of thoughts and ideas. And if you dare have an, a thought or idea that's from somewhere else, well, then you're a, you know, you're a splitter, you're, 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 you're wrong, you get shouted down, you get called a racist, you get called all sorts of other labels. And we've lost that ability to talk to each other. Totally. And by the way, I hate the fact that Winston Peters, who I blame for the position we're currently in, <laughs> did go down and talk to the protesters. That that really irks me. <laughs> so the people the people who should have didn't, and yet, and yet, yet here was him uh, prepared to go down and do that. Well, the thing about that too is that he had media following him around during that, and he told them all to go away. I'm not here to talk to you. I'm here to listen to these no. people. And he didn't make a speech and he didn't stand up and grandstand. He just walked and talked and listened. 
And that's Smart what, politics. That's what we, when we voted in MMP, we wanted to remove the power of the parties and the two-party state that we'd become with Labour yeah. and National and swapping shirts and really not getting anywhere by doing that. When people voted in MMP, they had this motherhood and apple pie naive view that somehow we're all going to get along now and we'd have these governments that that talked and listened and and represented a majority of people. And the reality of MMP is that the politicians just treated it exactly the same. They just found a different way to do it. Um, Back and- in the early 90s when uh, MMP was being debated, I did a, I did a speaking series on them on, with Michael Laws. And so yep. Michael was debating the pro-MMP position and I was debating the uh, the anti. And it's interesting because many of the arguments that I was putting at the time around why M- MMP wouldn't work were being poo-pooed by Michael and, and pretty much anybody who was pro. And yet the, most of them have actually turned out to be true with the fullness of time and, and actually seeing this thing in place. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he, again, easy to be wise in hindsight. Well, that's how wisdom comes because you've experienced life exactly what we were talking about earlier, you know, when people go in, into politics too early without any life experiences. They don't have any wisdom. They make stupid decisions. Yeah, totally, totally, totally. This, so this election – so, sorry, yep. You, I was I, just going to say, in fact, probably exactly the same question you were just going to ask. What's your handle on how it's all going to come, how it's all going to pan out on, on in October? That's exactly what I was going to ask. Actually, I was going to say this election <laughs> is, you know, in all my life of looking at elections, everyone is always these, you know, superlatives. This is the most important election in a lifetime. There's, and I've seen, yep. you know, 1990 with the landslide of um, of Jim Bolger. I've seen the, you know, the end of the Muldoon era. Um, I've seen the end of Helen Clark. That all seems to be so small in terms of the issues and things that we were debating back then compared to now. Yep. And I think at, at the core issues that I'm seeing that I think are important are a loss of freedoms, a loss of rights, yep. uh, a yep. rise of state power, a rise of the deep yep. state, uh, all of these things. And I'm, I'm, I'm just interested to know what your thoughts are on this election, how important it is that we really put a stake in the ground here and say no, no more, we're not having any more of this, and what those things are exactly that we don't want to have view. any more. I have exactly the same view. I'm 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 really concerned about the the the, the rise of wokeism in particular and the impact that that's had on the 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 national and the international psyche of, of the way that people think. But although when I say that, I suspect that's got more to do with. Certainly, those on the right, the fear of saying things rather than necessarily believing this stuff. And the reason I say that is it's interesting the Posey, Posey Parker thing. Um, mm. Up until that point, there had been very little debate on the whole issue of gender ideology. And you could have you could have been excused for believing at that stage that everybody went along with it. The Posey Parker thing kind of split that wide open and gave those of us who were on the other side of that, that issue the, the permission to basically talk. And now there's a much more open dialogue on both sides of that. So so that was a, that was encouraging. That's a positive thing, which is interesting because she achieved that without actually opening her mouth. So so but putting that aside, there are some really fundamental divides on the left and the right. It's no longer left and right. It's it's no. it's alt left and alt right to some degree. Um, so this is a really important election, and I guess my worry about the outcome of this election is the extent to which some of that, because because for me, putting aside everything I just said about the position of the National Party and the fact that they're currently sitting on the centre right, the centre left, sorry, yeah. um, I still think it's really important that we get a change of government, even if it's not an ideal government, we've got to get rid of what we've currently got in place. And in that regard, I've got some real concerns about the extent to which the uh, the right wing vote currently is splintered and the splintering of, of individual little parties, proliferation of little parties that have popped up and who are on their own, none of them are taking any particularly large share, but collectively they might take 7 or 8%, which could actually be quite important when it comes to the election night result. Now, my view on that when people ask me is, this is the election to vote national or act, but not to vote for anybody else to vote for national or act. If, if you've got concerns about traditional conservative politics, wait till the election is following, because there'll be a three-year period when once you've got a national act coalition in power, then you can start thinking about centre-right alternatives to that. Right now, the priority for everybody on the right is to vote for the only two parties that can actually form a government, and that's national and act. And I've got a real concern that 
I, I, as each day passes, I have that concern lessened because as the polls are going in the right direction, Labor's dropping, I think the chances of that are less than they were a month ago. But I'm still concerned. So, so for me, my gut feeling is this is going to be a pretty comfortable win for, for a, a national-led coalition, but it may well be a parliament that's got a fragmentation of, of some other weird and wonderful parties as well. You may, you, you may well have a, a, a New Zealand first back in parliament. Um, you know, you, you could even have top. That would be an extreme result, but who knows? Um, so you may have a proliferation of little parties and, and then a government sitting on sort of 63 to 64%. Um, and that'll be interesting if that happens. It'll be interesting in terms of what that means. But what we've got to do is we've got to break the, the, the stronghold that the, that the sort of the woke ideology of, of Adern and her cohort um, have had over the country over the last six years. The wasted vote is a concern because at the 2020 election, 9% or 257,000 or 258,000 odd votes were were yep. wasted. You know, um, 75,000 75, of those votes were New Zealand first, and forty three thousand of those yep. were were top, but there was yep. all of these you know little parties there soaking up small amounts of of uh, support and really have got zero chance of getting into parliament. And, and I hear what you're saying yep. about uh, national enact. I think there's a distinct possibility that we will see a return of New Zealand first. And my view is is that national is the other side of the coin that Labour is on, and there is a risk of wokeism infecting the National Party, and so we need to have a bulwark, a bulwark against that, uh, that sort of wokeism of the National Party, and that in some respects is ACT, but then David Seymour's a little bit sort of woke as well, you know, um, and a bit squishy on some of these things. And so then the, the you need the hard conservatives like New Zealand First or I don't think there's realistically anybody else uh, out there that would temper that and say, no, no, we're not going to do that. We, we, we're not going to have... You say that, mm. Sorry, mate, I was just going to say, it's interesting you say that about ACT, because when you look at ACT, so, so ACT on, on economics are, are entirely orthodox, and, and yes. you know I would support pretty much most of their positions. But when you start looking at their social policies, there's some wacky stuff in there. They're all over the place. Yeah. Um, and, and, it, and, it's, and it's much less easy to define as, as being centre-right. I agree with, I understand, I mean, I don't like New Zealand first, I don't like Winston, I don't particularly yep. idea the, the idea of them being in Parliament, but I understand your point. <clears throat> I guess my argument is that the time to look at creating a strong um, alternative Conservative Party is in three years between 2023 and 2026. Yeah. That's the time, whether, yeah. whether it's a coalition of the existing Conservative groups or a brand new force that comes up, I don't know, but that's the time to talk about it once we've yeah. safely got a... Yeah, you know, I tend a, to agree a, with you on, on that. But the, the problem with all these small parties, and it's a perennial problem with them, is they're very usually driven either by a single agenda or a dynamic um, personality that you know has developed a bit of a cult Correct. following, and they don't like Correct. playing. They don't play well with others because uh, you Correct. know the, the, it's like the libertarians. You know, I, I kind of like you know resonated with them for years and years and years, but the reality of them getting into parliament was a very small chance of of them ever yep. getting there. Um, so consequently, their ideas were never actually entertained. And I I once told them go and you know, infiltrate other parties and spread your ideas inside those because I don't think National's ever going to be a conservative, a conservative party. You know, it, not in Again, name, yeah. not even in a, with a little C. It's like a silent C. Um, I don't think they're ever going to be that again. I completely agree. And so there, there is there is an opportunity for that. It's just not this election. Interestingly, I've had, uh, I think it's just two, I don't think there's any other, but two different political parties have approached me in the last six or seven months asking for advice on you know, what they can do to, to, to increase their share and, and what they should be doing and what, you know, what sort of threat. And in both cases, I've said to them, Hold up your tent and go and go catch it all and think about what you're thinking about now in nine months' time after we've safely got a national government about. Neither of them wanted to hear that. Although no. I noticed that one of them did exactly that later on. I won't, won't mention who it was, but one which which was a, a, never really made any sort of impact. But I see that they've now uh, they've now folded their tent and joined into uh, New Zealand First, which was a good move. But uh, 
it, it's a hard thing to hear because these people have, as you say, they've either got an enduring philosophy that they think is, you know, it's sort of a social credit approach to politics, yeah. uh, or they've got a dynamic leader, or at least what they think is a dynamic leader is somebody who's going to sort of lead the masses to the promised land. And it, 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 you know, there, there are very few Winston Peters and Bob Joneses on the political no. landscape. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, in November 2022, you wrote an article on your site called The Biggest Threat. Yep. Do you think that is the same threat now? I can't no. remember what I wrote. Remind me what that said, Ken. <laughs> you said how to counter the biggest threat to our nation, and uh, you basically talk about you – know, we've kind of touched on this – where differences in political opinions are now dividing families, ending friendships, sometimes leading to violent confrontation between protagonists. And you're talking about how we've lost civility uh, and that there's anger in almost every debate. Do you still see that as... Oh, as- yeah. Yes, it do. It's, it's, it's probably receded a little bit, and it's receded a little bit, I think, because it's almost like we've a lot of us have woken up out of this amnesia that we were in. So there was a period between 2020 and probably mid-2022 where I think um, that what I said in that article was absolutely true. It was this this protracted division where where there was no ability, you know, there was no ability to stand around a barbecue and 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 have honest differences of opinion. You either hold one position. COVID was a good example of that, but it was also true in things like you know the whole woke gender around gender and and some of these other things. I think that's receded a little bit, and I think it's receded for two reasons. I think it's come back a little bit because, as I say, we've sort of we've come back from the brink and actually realised how bad things have gotten. That's not who we are as a country, but I also think if you look around the Western world and you see that there are um, that the right is starting to win uh, government in, in, in national elections in different parts of the world, I think that's also having a little bit of an impact as people are starting to realise, hey, perhaps this stuff isn't the. If, if I think about, for example, the agenda of the Greens and and to a lesser degree Labour, it's it's just repackaged communism or socialism. It's the same stuff that hasn't worked over the last 40 or 50 years. And what happens is every 20 or so years, the generation of kids that, um, you know, there's a new generation comes along, doesn't realise what a massive failure was, how many people died in the name of those things and, and, and you know, buy into this idea that it's going to work again. Um, but But right now, if if that had some ascendancy over the last two or three years, I think it's sort of gone off the boil a little bit. And it's interesting because the, the spluttering voice of that now is the Greens. You know, look yeah. at some of the stuff that's coming out of the Greens. They're kind of the, the last hurrah of that stuff as we move back toward a, what I think is a more practical centre-right, centre-left position. Um, and, and I hope, I hope I'm right, that if we get a, a national coalition for all of its faults, and for all of the issues that I might take with it, you'll mm. see a return to some of those more traditional New Zealand values and policies over the next three, six, hopefully nine years of that government, albeit with, as you correctly say, some some wokeism that wouldn't have been present in, nation, in a national government even 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, you know, what you're saying is correct. You're never going to find a party that... that you know, gives you a hundred percent of what you want. If you if it, you do find a party that gives you a hundred percent of what you want, then you need to question whether or not you're a cult member. <laughs> you know, but but I always say to people, you know, for this election, it's very important. This election, we have to remove the the, the you know the the racists that we have in power, the people who wish to separate yep. us, uh, yep. dominate us, subjugate us, control us. They need to be gone. And that means yep. that we have to really make sure that the Labour Party, the Green Party, and to Party Maori are taught a very valuable lesson that the voters are important. And we don't we live in New Zealand and we don't want and don't need to have all of this, you know, uh these pathways to separatism that we're heading on, whether it's whether you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, whether you're you have the right ancestors or not. Um, whether you're what they call progressive, you know, it's all about controlling and dominating language and behaviours. And we need to we need to go back to, and not so much the hedonistic values of the individual, but protect individual rights and and human rights, uh, and fight for those like they mean something. You know, it's all very well to have have campaigns around the country um, talking about freedom of speech. But when you get a real test of freedom of speech and you are found to be wanting in that regard, then we need to totally. hold you to account for that. Even the race issue, though, Cam, it's interesting you should raise that one. It might surprise you to hear me say this, but I'm actually, I am reasonably supportive of some of that, that agenda. But I'll, but I'll tell you, here's the difference. 
Um, under Finlayson and prior to that, under Doug Graham and the national government, you yeah. actually had quite a bit of, of progress in that space. They did it in a way that took the country with them. So, yeah. so instead of forcing it down our throats and saying, this is what we're doing, tough luck if you don't like it, they explained what they're doing, they, were, they brought the country along, and in the process of doing that, they healed a lot of wounds that, that otherwise wouldn't have been healed. The difference with these guys is it, it's basically our way of the highway. So I'll give you a really good example of that. This stuff around naming conventions over government departments and even yeah. some, some local body of energy. I actually haven't got an issue with that provided you take people with you. And the way you take people with you is, A, you put both the English and the Māori version so you make sure that people can actually understand, yep. and B, you do it in a way where you're explaining to people why you're doing it. So I do fear, and this is a reaction, don't get me wrong, this is a pendulum. Mm. So, so when I look at some of my compatriots on the right, there, there's, some, there's some fairly racist reactions to this yep. stuff, and it's a, re, it's a response and a reaction to what to what the government's doing. And it's and it's it's because of that. So if they were doing it in a different way where they're actually bringing people with them, I suspect you would find there'd be a lot more support for it. So it's not so much what they're doing, it's how they're doing it. It's how they're forcing it down people's throats. Oh, totally. Absolutely. You, you're 100% correct on that. We, we, you know, and it's been done in a, in a rather sinister way as well. You know, you're seeing it's, it's been organised. You know, we've seen all of, the, all of the news media in lockstep. You know, we've got we've got an article in the Herald on Tuesday where there's some guy who's a sports coach who's saying that he's a better sports coach because he um, has incorporated, you know, um, Maori science into his sports coaching. I'm thinking, what? This is nuts. I know. You know, it's I know. it's, it's I know. crazy. There's no critical. You know, it's 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 almost like there's this and. You know, I don't want to sound racist because I'm not, but this Maori wonderfulness that that it's a, a revisionist view of the past and creating a fantasy that a lot of academics and particularly government people as well buy into that there was this nirvana in New Zealand that was upset by these awful colonialists that came here. And, and so it, that comes from, and you'll be familiar. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, and that comes, and you'll be familiar with this, obviously, but that, that's, that's not just about Māori culture. That's, that's critical race theory. That's the whole concept of white privilege. And so that comes from this idea that, that indigeneity is, is, a, is a quality and a virtue and that, and that indigenous peoples in any land can do no wrong. Mm. Um, and, that the, and that the cause of society's ills is, is colonialism. And, and ultimately, if you take it back to its, you know, its basis, it comes from sort of the, the Caucasians who have you know, who've infected the world with their disease. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some aspects of colonialism that we should be ashamed and embarrassed of. I'm, I'm the first to say that. There are some aspects of, if you, if you think about what colonialism was driven by, and it's interesting because it segues back to how we started this conversation, yeah. it was driven primarily by Christianity. It was yeah. driven by the battle between the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church was wanting to get to nations first with the Bible in one hand and trade in the other with their version of what of, of the message of the gospel. And so, and and so to the extent that they did that, there were some atrocities that were carried out in the process of doing that. But, and that's fine. I think we should, we should acknowledge that. We should be honest about it, and we should recognise it. But let's not then turn that on its head and pretend that everything that was virtuous in the nations that we came to until the Europeans came. There was there were some pretty atrocious things going on in New Zealand and, and or, or Aotearoa, if you want to call it that, and other parts of the world at that period of time as well, which were um, assuaged by by the entrance of Europeans. There were some good things that came with that. But here's the thing about this that I find most fascinating, is if those who promote this idea that colonialism was a bad thing and should never have happened had their way, uh, with the exception of a, of a handful of POMs who've immigrated here over the last sort of, you know, 50 years and a few other nationalities, almost none of us, European or Māori, would actually have ever been born. And that's the idea. So these people who are arguing for, you know, a return or reversion back to this previous society would never have existed if that colonialism hadn't taken place. So while it may not have come with, with, with you know, it may not be completely virtuous in terms of the way that it was applied, it, that the society that we now have, rightly or wrongly, is a direct result of that. And so for me, the answer is not to look back, it's to look forward. It's to say, how do we work together as, 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 as one people and, and, and work forward and make this the best society that we possibly can? 
Yeah, and I think we also need to acknowledge um, Maori, Maori's own oral history. You know, the reality is, is that we're all colonizers in this country, including Maori. Yeah. They, they were the first colonizers. Yeah. You know, they yep. came they came yep. here in a boat just like everybody else. And yep. uh and that's yep. kind of forgotten in our history things. Now, one last thing I wanted to just touch on, Ashley, that a lot of people don't talk about is um sure. is that you uh, are very open in your support for Israel. Yeah. As, as am very, I. Very, very yeah, as am I. And you know, we get I well, I certainly get attacked for being uh pro Israel for want of a better term. Is that is has your position come about because of your conservatism and your faith, or is there another driver? Uh, yeah, so interesting you say that. So, so although I've been a shopping Christian for the last forty years, one thing I've always been very um, animated on, even bad when I was a bad Christian, was um, was around um, prophecy, Bible prophecy, yeah. yeah, and and it's something I took a lot of interest in. And so, for a big part of that time, I and I won't bore people with the definition of this, but I was into something called premillennialism, which is so it, it's a belief system within Christianity that's got a whole lot of. And one of those was that 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 Israel had been put aside by God because it had disobeyed him, that Christians had taken the place of Israel and were now the new Israel, the spiritual Israel, if you like. Last yeah. 15 or so years, I've realized that's out of garbage. It's complete nonsense. So that, is, is that Israel is, is front and center when it comes to Bible prophecy. It always has been. Um, it has an extraordinarily role, uh, important role to play in terms of where we are. I obviously believe in this idea that we, we're getting close to the end of civilization, or certainly this particular um, uh, period of the civilization, and Israel's absolutely crucial to that. In fact, so much so, um, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this or not, but I've actually written a couple of books on this topic, and I'm about to publish one of them soon, which is which is actually explaining exactly the role of Israel and where it fits into this oh, bigger picture. Make sure you send me so, a copy. So it, oh, absolutely. So it's tied into my faith. Um, but just putting all of that aside and just looking at it at a secular level, the the the, the barrage, the infective barrage of, of criticism of Israel, the claims of apartheid, um, and most, it's just complete garbage. It is absolute garbage. And when you actually understand this country and its history and you look at the way that it operates, the way that it treats um, uh, people who, who, who in any other nation would, would be treated extremely badly, um, and, and tries to do the right thing by them. And just it, its whole demeanour toward what it sees as its responsibility being a democratic state in the Middle East, um, it's completely at odds with the propaganda that you hear. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a massive supporter and will be till the day I die. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm an, I've come to this same position. I've always been a, a supporter of Israel. But when I went there in 2014, uh, you know, people say, well, "Why are you going there?" You know, they're at war with um, with the Palestinians, and I said, "Well, no, it's the other way around. Actually, the Palestinians are at exactly. war with Israel." And um, yep. you know, I was accused of all sorts of things. And and look, the country reminded me of New Zealand thirty years ago—a can-do attitude, Absolutely. filled with inventors that are making do and doing things kind of because they have to. And it really yep. reminded me of what New Zealand was like, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. And, and you know, I, we, I think we've lost, I think we've lost a lot of our, uh, our core strengths in New Zealand um, over the years. And so I looked to Israel as, as, as a guiding light for how through necessity and working together, you can become a great nation. And I just am Wait, hoping that, that after this election, that we put all of this nonsense aside, this polarization, this uh, extremism uh, on both sides, and come together as a nation, and to use the the amazing uh, resources that we have, and the and that includes the human resources that we have, to make New Zealand yep. the greatest country in the world. Couldn't agree with you more. Couldn't agree with you more. Interestingly, and it's probably a good point to end on, but if you want mm. to if you just tie it back to a biblical position, the um, if if you wanted a foreign policy which which just about guaranteed you a, a, a you know a, a pretty benevolent place in the world, it's right at the beginning of the Bible. It's in Genesis twelve three and it's talking about the 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 attitude of other nations toward Israel and it says, I will bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee. And and that might sound pretty simplistic, but if you look at that throughout history, 
uh, the nations that have attacked Israel and have taken the belligerent attitude toward Israel have ultimately paid the price for that. The nations that have, that have blessed Israel and have done what they can to support it, the United States is a really good example of that, have gone on to, be, to bigger and better things. Um, so, you know, you, you, you couldn't go too far wrong as a nation to have your starting point as foreign policy of making sure that you were supporting Israel and doing everything that you could to support its position in the world. And that's one of the things that, even though you don't like Winston Peters, that's one of the things he's strongest <laughs> on is support of Israel. So, so yeah, on that I, note, I know, Ashley, yeah. I think we will leave it there. <laughs> no problem, but hey, I've enjoyed the chat. Thanks for the opportunity. No problem. Thank you very much, Ashley Church. I thoroughly enjoyed that chat with Ashley Church. His faith is certainly giving him a different perspective on politics and it's clear that he cares very deeply about the direction the country is currently heading in and what we can do about finding solutions to that. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 2057. So get in touch with us now. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand, with the government constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To revive Honest Media and support RCR, join our Foundation Membership Club today. To learn more, visit realitycheck.radio slash members. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. Matt McCartan is one of New Zealand's finest experts in the dark arts of politics. He and I have a long history on opposing sides, but Matt has always been easy to deal with and a straight shooter. He is one of my most respected operators in politics, and he's with me now as this week's political tragic. Welcome, Matt. Morning, brother. Uh, we've had a long and uh, fractious uh, uh, relationship politically, haven't we, Matt? We have indeed. We have indeed. Well, I wouldn't say, yeah, well, fractious, um, but not personal. But we uh, come from different sides of the uh, field. So we engage. When, when we engage, it's normally over conflict. Yep. But so you... been amicable. Well, that's the thing, Matt, is, uh, you know, We've never seen eye to eye politically, but on some issues we've contacted each other for assistance uh, now and then, and have a what I call a collegial business opera, um, you know, relationship with each other, and we seem to get on all right. And it's yeah. it seems to be uh, something that is somewhat lacking in politics these days. Um, yes. Mainly because this, this, this is my experience. Because I, I, I come from a trade union background, it's that I'm negotiating with um, employers, some mm. good, you know, they're just doing their job. Um, yeah. And then some who are, I deal a lot in the migrant exploitation world. Yeah. And if people have a belief system like you and I have, then you can disagree on the issue you are discussing but it's not personal. What I find is what politics is personal when people don't really, this is my experience, that people who take things personally seem to not really have a strong, they're not really in politics because of politics, uh, yeah, for, or political core, 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 it comes quite personal. Why mm. would I get upset as an absurd, uh, adversary who's articulating is what they believe in? Yeah. Right? Like why? Why would I get upset by that? Because we live in a civil society, right? So we're debating, and sometimes I know it will shock you, Ken. But sometimes you you might be right, and I might have to accept it. And on the other hand, that might be the same. You see, and that's where you you're a conviction. We do conviction pop politics, so therefore it's not personal, you know. And so therefore, what I find in the middle ground of politics sort of is like their political differences aren't that great. So therefore, they they tend to make their differences quite personal. That has just be my opinion. Well, you know, politics tends to be a zero-sum game where one side has to win and the other side has to lose. And I think that uh, over time, both you and I have 
kind of ended up in the same place. You're talking about the middle ground and, you know, I'm no longer, um, you know, a tribal gnat or tribal any particular political party. And I'm looking for solutions that are, great, uh, are good for the country as a whole um, with a, a firm belief that we should look after New Zealand first and foremost um, ahead of perhaps some of the other countries around the world that, you know, always seeking New Zealand's input. And well, so, so I think, you know, you and I are, uh, have come from different ends of the political spectrum and we're meeting in the middle, which is kind of ironic considering where we've both come from. <laughs> I think you should wash your mouth out as when, as, as when you say the middle. Um, it's a dirty word. We can't have that. No, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, if we're not aligned to political parties. Mm. When you align to a political part parties, you have a certain collective responsibility, right? You can't be a free agent. You can't eat, eat, you know, you can't have it both ways. So that when you're not, you can say what you think, you know, with, with, without that sense, I can't say that because that compromises the yeah. change. Yeah. So then you've always been a bit of a free agent sort of any, any, anyway. Um, and a lot of times I haven't been, but you know, you, you, you keep, you keep your own faith. You know, and, you, and you always be, um, um, you have disciplines on you at times, but you should always articulate what you believe in. And I think that you've always, well, my relationship with you, you've always been that. Don't like some of it, um, but I know that you believe it, you know, mm. and that's important, and I respect that. So, sorry, and I sort of forget that. I ca- I'll come back to what I, was, I started off with about employers. I will work with any of them because... They believe in what they've got to do. Yeah, they've got a responsibility to shareholders, et cetera. And I've got a responsibility to the workers. And therefore, you both can see that you have a difference and a conflict of interest. You just do. But yeah. that doesn't make it all personal. That makes it is that you have a responsibility both sides. And I always say to a lot of the bosses said, look, I don't like this capital so, 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 so very much at all. But I don't bring that to the table. I'm here to do work on behalf of your workers, and therefore we accept that. And once we get past that ideological stuff, we're just there to do the job. And so I've always been able to keep an integrity with the people I go up against with. Always can shake hands, you know, and I think that that's important. I do that in politics as too, as well. That's why I don't get personal about that. I never have. Never have. Well, I've always found you to be a man of your word, Matt. And, um, you know, we've looked each other in the eye across the table and shaken hands on on yep. particular things. We may not have 100% agreed with where we were heading on that, but we 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 found a solution to a particular problem and, and we've gone ahead with that. And I've always respected you for your ability to do that. And it's one of the things that I find missing a lot in politics these days, the ability to sit down across a table or have a beer or a Chardonnay or whatever your particular tipple is uh, and and actually nut out some solutions. Yeah, well, you and I are old school, right? Mm. And we come from old school. And the world has changed now where people can't be straight, you know, and can't be direct Mm. because it's all about feelings. And I yeah. think that the institutions in society now have been inherited by the culture of, and I, and I say this and I don't mean it in a way it could be um, construed, but I come from a background of working class people, just talk straight. Yeah. And I've been with bosses, talk straight. Um, but what I deal with in politics now, everyone is watching is what they say and also what they think. And I think that's made us a, a less tolerant society and a less honest society, you know, and and I think that's what I admire those who have beliefs. They actually say what they think, and I think that you know, but that's coming less and less so. Well, that, that that's what's prompted you to join the free free speech union, isn't it? Yeah, 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 indeed, indeed. And of course, all of my well mates on my uh, left of the thing just say, "Oh, this is a right wing thing. You shouldn't belong to it." This is about an issue of free speech. Mm. And I've just been appalled at those that I have to explain sometimes to, like, and, and it stresses me to have to explain to them, free speech has always been an issue, a campaign of the left. 
Yep. It was always about, because free speech was muzzled by those without power, and that those who had power used the state to get. So with unions, I just know, you know, the amount of time I've been silenced um, in the work that I do, you know, run off to the authority or the courts, get muzzled or, 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 or dissolved. If you look at the history of any country but New Zealand, you know, 51, they passed laws that you weren't even allowed to speak to the workers. The workers were not to be given voice. I, I've got a, um, a gazetna donated to me by the old communists, and yep. they used it during the 51 Blue to do printing of their ma- of their leaflets in the, um, in the Hillsborough uh, graveyard in the cemetery there. They were in one of the things, and they used to do their printing there at night because they were not allowed to have their message heard, heard out. And all the tradition has always been that state stops those without power from speaking. And I just, I, I, I don't know how the left has got itself into a position, or many of the left, I should say, I shouldn't say all, um, seem to think that free speech is dangerous. Just extraordinary. Well, that's where they're talking about these, <clears throat> you know, these hate speech laws. And I always say with things like that and with censorship and, you know, all of the things that we saw happen during the madness of the pandemic with the government of the day and supported by the opposition parties, I might add, leapt on board totalitarianism in a heartbeat, something that you've spent a lifetime fighting against. And oh. I've spent a lifetime explaining why we must never go down this path of the state having these awesome powers. Because, you know, I always say, be careful what you wish for. You know, the, the right wing might bring in, in you know, someone might bring in hate speech laws, but I can see the left wing um, being silenced by the very laws that they brought in. Oh, absolutely. Look, look I, 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 um, uh, I accept that when the, um, when the pandemic took hold in the world, that people were scared. Mm. And that we, New Zealand was lucky because we were down the other end of the world and it took a, it took a while to get here. So we had time to get precautions in. And whether you believe in the vaccine or not, I think that New Zealand handled it well, but then continued on where it was unnecessary, keeping things in So, But I was, the thing which I got from it was the power of the state and how the left just, just, just marched in step with it. I, 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 I was just, I found that extraordinary. And, this, and I think the thing which was really stunned me was when the, campers, um, the occupiers, went to par- Parliament, yep. and the trade union movement, you know, um, passed a resolution and put out a statement supporting the police removing the protesters. <laughs> and I just, like, I was just stunned. Now, I, I'm not in the leadership of the trade union movement anymore, but I called my old union, which I founded, yep. and said to them, you know, we can't have a part of any of that. And and the CPU put the state statement out, and I understand my union went went along with it. Which I just think, where does a union movement support the state removing protesters from the people's parliament in a civil society? You know, what way would they be afraid of the people? Want to shut them down? You know, you and I both know. In another life, you see, you'd have someone like a Muldoon or a uh, mm. Norm, Norm Kirk. They'd go down there like Winston Peters did. You go and take a look what the thing, and you engage. But what we have is a fear of the people, and that if we don't like their ideas or what they're saying, instead of debating, we'll close it down. And I mean, how hard would it have been for them to go and put up a, a tent and a couple of chairs and a table and say, oh, it right? Would it would have been great because if Jacinda, you know, St. Jacinda, Went down down there. No, but she was very pop popular, right? And she goes yep. down with, with 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 a number of the MPs and said, "Look, let's have a dialogue, you know, mm-hmm. and be respectful." And New Zealanders are respectful, you know. I mean, they are. It's just our our culture. Yeah. And you know, it it, it would have been um, it's like when Helen Clark, when she wouldn't meet the Maori land march or the uh, seabed and foreshores. Yeah. She, to meet sheep, uh, uh, sh- uh, shriek, shriek the sheep, and wouldn't uh, engage with them. You see, and that, all that thing is about this, this respect, and you create something that you probably wish you hadn't. 
if Clark hadn't had treated the Māori protesters with more respect when they came round to Parliament, may well maybe they wouldn't have had a Māori party. You know, maybe because they said, well, we're, we're going to have our own voice. Why Jacinda, I think, and Mallard mishandling the protest, supported by the you know the, the institutional left. Um, I think they missed an opportunity to hinder and I think it's built a working class resentment, which you know was unnecessary. So and if you if you'd been Jacinda Ardern's chief of staff, would you have advised her to go and talk to them? And, absolutely. And absolutely. Would, do you think that would have diffused the whole situation, and they would have packed up and gone home after a couple of days? Well, even if they didn't go home, got this. You know, they're entitled. I, I'm, I'm a well. You know, I've always protested, right? Because I think that bringing gr- grievances to the attention is important in a civil society. All change it comes through confrontation. It doesn't come to, through persuasion. You know, every every time you have a major push, it's because there's been conflict. Mm. And I'm not saying physical conflict. I'm saying it's a conflict of ideas that needs to be expressed. So, you know, if Jacinda had gone down down there, she would have um, gained the respect, but also given respect to the protesters. You know, so say, look, you know, because they had a legitimate beef, and whether you agree with it or not, it was legitimate right to protest and saying that we were going too far in the misuse of the state. And I, I there, were, there were anti-vaxxers and others that, but that's just smears. Okay, yes, sir. But there were a lot of other people there. Mm. And the people I know who are friends of mine who are independent journalists or like yourself, they went down and one of them, uh, which you would know, he went down and just interviewed the protest and put it up. And he got pilloried. Pilloried. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. for interviewing the, the protesters. When has that ever happened in in left politics? It's just you know, it's it's like it's a different beast now. Well, I'm f- I find it strange, Matt. I have to say that you and I seem to have more in agreement with each other these days than we ever did in the past. And we'll have to work on our d- 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 differences before the end of the call. That way, that we can get back to normal. <laughs> I don't know if I want to go back to normal. I'm enjoying uh, having discourse with political opponents without yeah, any I, sort of, I, you know, anger or or distrust or or angst or anything negative. It's just conversation, and I'm enjoying it. And um, I, I I wish I could pour myself. You know, back in time and change a few things. Do you wish you, there's some aspects, Matt, that you could go back in time to to do something different? Oh, not more than once an hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's talk Anybody about. Who says that they have no 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 regrets of not had a life. <laughs> no, exactly. Well, let's talk about um, something that's not too far in the in the distant past. In 2014, you were the chief of staff to David Cunliffe. Yes, I was. You had an election campaign where David Cunliffe uh, announced uh, at the campaign launch that this this is what he said, this election campaign should not be about dirty tricks or dodgy deals or smear campaigns or even a personality cult. Now, that was on the 7th of July, 2014. Now you were in that in in a group of the Labour Party, and you came up with the slogan "Vote Positive," which at the time I sat there scratching my head. What does that mean? What does that mean? And it didn't mean anything, and it certainly didn't mean anything during the election campaign, unless one thing happened, and that one thing was the release of Nikki Hager's book, Dirty Politics. So I, I'm just going to put you on the spot now, Matt. No, okay. How much heads up did you guys have about his book? I can't speak for others. I'll speak for, for myself. Absolutely. Yeah. So you've got to remember, I went down there in the early part of 2014. Yeah. And I had been, as I said, to come with sort of at, at the time, I've been trying to kill your party for the last 10, 10 to 20 years, right, from the Alliance side. But yeah. the Alliance is no longer around, so, you know, I'm a working class boy, so it can help. But I was, um, I hadn't been part of the Labour Party thing, you know, since my 20s. 
you know, so 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 I didn't really know the internal culture. I mean, I knew enough about them, but so I always decision about being positive and um and um and inside for the things. I had no knowledge of them because they were done before I arrived. You know, yeah. so 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 it wasn't. I'm I'm not thinking. Of, you know, if I knew about it, I'd I'd say it. Um, what does your gut say though, Matt? About what does your gut say about how close Labour was to Nikki Hager, and that the book was not just a mere coincidence, but actually planned? Not. I have no knowledge of that. And if you ask me anything, I know Nikki. You know, um, yeah. uh, in the early days, he never was close to Labour at all. And I yeah. never saw him in any late Labour events or had his name around his or Nicky and Nicky's mate. He always had this thing to be independent. Um, and the conversations I've ever had with him, uh, he's got nothing to do with the late Labour Party. I think Helen Clark was one of his books in her election, right, that she attacked him. Um, yeah, the seeds of distrust. Yeah, so I, I, I think... You know, and look, I, I, I'm going back, it's a long time ago now, but hand on heart, I don't recall in a meeting where I where I was involved in is there's any discussion about our mate, Nicky. Yeah. I, I don't recall that at all. Um, and I haven't seen Nicky for 20 years. You know, yeah. So he's a Wellington sort of creature. Well, as I said before earlier, earlier on in this interview, Matt, I've, You've always found you a man of your word, and I'll accept that you don't know know anything about that. But it just seemed to me to be a very happy coincidence, at the very least. Yeah, my experience is that parties, I know this will shock you, but parties aren't that smart. (laughs) No, it doesn't shock me at all. (laughs) (laughs) I know. You know, know, that the world, you think everyone's clever and they're sitting in bunkers and plotting things out, and they've got their mats up on the wall, and they... Kind of think of thing, and you know, and people kind of, kind of think there's some master plan. Most of the thing is just gambling, um, yeah, and and cock ups, yeah, you know, and and you know, because everything, as you know, in our politics or party politics is all committee itis that all decisions are never made, and um, you sit in rooms and you talk about things, but you don't really decide a lot. And most of the politicians I've come across are not conviction politicians in the way that. I would like them to be so they have trouble in making decisions, you know, and you know, because they've taken all the things, what if and what if. I was a bit lucky with Jim Anderton, mm-hmm. and I know that PP people have a jaundiced view of Jim at many times, but one thing he had, which was very good, he 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 believed in stuff, he believed in stuff, yeah. and he made decisions. Yes. And I think that's the requirement. Uh, you know, Richard Prepper Pre- Pre- once said to me, which I thought was good, he goes, the main thing in politics you need to have is ability to have courage and yep. ability to make decisions. Yep. Or, or, or to have courage and ability to make decisions. And he's right. Most politicians, and certainly those who are centre, seeing centre left or centre right, you know, there's a bit of mush in there, they're yep. not like that. You ever think no. about committee itis and, you know, and everyone's all scared and they all watch each other, but they don't really think about what, do we do to help, you know, to make our society be better, fairer, better, you know, at least to have a view. So I have more respect for those on the right who have who have a conviction about something, then at least I know what we're dealing with. And you can make agreements and shake hands and get yeah. past you along the pathway because at least you're fighting about a, an issue, not about where I like somebody. What do I care? It's not about us. No, yeah. and, and that's the that's the thing is that, you know, I, I used to be on Martin Bradbury's TV show and he always tried to have a guest on that was going to attack me and um, get Cam. And, you know, he, he used to say, I'll oh, get Chris Trotter on. He's very smart. He'll beat Cam. And it was always for Martin a zero-sum game. Someone had to win and someone had to lose. And I think it was um, extreme frustration for him when Chris Trotter and I or you and I or, or anybody else would be on the show and, and at some point one or other of us would say, you know what, I, you know, I think Matt's right on that. Or Chris Trotter would say, you know what, I agree with Cam on that. And um, I don't think he ever understood that by and large we all want the same things for this country. We've just got a different approach to get there. I think 
think that's right at some point. You know, it, it, it's funny. When I negotiate as women well employers, they, they say to say, in the end, Matt, we all want the same thing. No, we don't. Because mm. your job is to maximise return to your share shareholders, and my job is to get a bigger return to the workers. So we don't yeah. have in common. Um, yeah, well, 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 we do, but we don't have, um, uh, we have conflicts of interest. But in a society, what we think is best, we'll have differences on that, but I think what we want to do is reach agreements that we think will advance us toward, toward or that. So I agree with you on that. So even though I tend to find a better political, I get better political education and be able to submit another view to to others on the right, and that's a healthier debate than sometimes mm. on the left because sometimes on the left, when you're with your own tribe, it's sort of really a religious experience about who's the best <laughs> of all. You know, like you yeah. know how, how we can be outraged at the most things. You know, you talk to people on the left on my side, right? You talk about something like, you know, if you want to, you want to upset the crowd and get them all going. Just use the word Trump. The way they go, you know, and then it becomes like, like how much we all hate him, but it doesn't actually advance us much, you know. No. And, and I think what's important about debates is I think it's actually testing your ideas, you know, yes. and then and then and then and then testing their ideas because you always come along. I always walk, walk walk away from any event and say, "What did I learn? Did I learn something? And if I didn't, well, what was the point?" <laughs> yeah. ah, exactly, exactly right. Let's move to more modern times. Mm -hmm. You're the ultimate insider. You know how political parties deal with crises and cock ups and stuff ups and everything else. Sure. Let's talk about an implosion of a career recently in the Labour Party. And I'm talking about Michael Wood here, a guy who was the understudy to Phil Goff for decades. Mm -hmm. Uh, has long wanted to be, you know, he probably has, still has uh, ambitions to be Prime Minister, and he tanked his career over essentially a Big Mac, chips and a Coke. Yeah. What, 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 tell, tell me, from your perspective, what you were thinking when you watched all this unfold, because I was gobsmacked. I just couldn't believe that someone would jeopardise their career in such a way over – the equivalent of a Big Mac, chips and a Coke. I, I, I agree. And, you know, you put it down to hubris, really, sort of really, really. You know, you know that when someone becomes an MP, the IQ jumps by 20 points. And they suddenly, <laughs> uh, you know, you know, before they were an MP that they were a nobody, then they suddenly become an MP and everyone all thinks they're important, right? And Michael's bright mm. um, and works hard, ambitious. And these are all good good traits. I like those people because they work hard. They want to prove themselves. And he, when he would see him, I wouldn't. I don't know if he would have succeeded, but he was not. He was not shy about positioning himself that one day I could be the prime minister. You know, yeah. and um, yeah. and then what happened? You know, and it's just extraordinary. So I think there's two points, right? I I, I think there is him, and. You know, you and I both know this, and I've been guilty of, of myself, right? You've got to have your personal life, you know, or your personal way, way you conduct yourself, pretty, pretty strong, you know, because yeah. if you're in a high, high, high powered job, you're going to be under a lot of stress, and you're going to, you've got to be careful about dropping the ball, you know. And I think you've got a blind spot. It was about a nothing. Um, the finances and all the trust stuff and the shares are really ma ma managed by his wife, Julie, right? Yeah. And I don't think between them he could keep, I don't know how our family operates, you know, like pillow talk and that, and they go, yeah, yeah I'll do it, I'll do it, not realising. I think that because he, you know, when you're so important to all these really important things, yeah. that seems a very small thing. But, you know, as you know, right, the Cabinet Office uh, went to him 12 times. Yeah. Now, which part of those 12, 12 times do you think, shit, I better get on with that, you know? Um, and he kept telling me what, but he wouldn't. Then three times they went to the prime minister's office. Mm. Now, see, and that's when, that's where I really think is where the problem is, right? You know, I get with my, my uncle is, is arrogant and they think, you know, I'm so special, it doesn't matter and all this sort of thing. Hey, I will get round to it. 
like not seeing the political thing, but someone like a chief of staff job is to look at it politically. And they should have gone down. You know, you and I know how it works. You go down there and say, I mean, but the cabinet officer has spoken to Jacinda twice. And so she's, oh no, she spoke to him twice. But you see, there's no baseball bat, right? <laughs> it's all like, let, let's hold hands and kumbaya and let's be gentle with each other, right? Yeah. What required was, was a growing up discussion. Hey, Michael, the Prime Minister said to you twice now, I want confirmation on Monday that they're all being sold. Are we clear? Good. Okay, now here's the thing. If you haven't given me the evidence by Monday, don't turn up the cabinet. Yeah. Okay, we got that. Are we all clear? All right, because it's not about you, it's about us. Yeah. Okay. And just don't turn up the cabinet. Then he would have sold them. Right? So it's a question of, you know, and you looked at the recently with uh, Kerry Alnack, you know, there's something about soft management, you know, and touchy feely, which comes and bites you in the ass. I yeah. think that's what happened with Michael. Nobody went to him and said, get it sold this week. Send me the sale, Dr. Hockman, and don't tune up to take cabinet until it's done. There was no Heather Simpson, was there? Exactly. No yeah. one who made just a mere you know, indication on your phone that Heather Simpson was calling you would would make your insides turn to liquid with well, fear. Yeah. I, I look, you know, as you know, right, there's a bit of um like all management, you you, you create these um iconic um, people because it suits their history, but yeah, she but but you had someone and she'd been there for a long time. And she was Clark's age two, you yeah. Know, she, she was saying, and so people knew that she had a she was more than just the chief. chief when she staff. spoke, she was speaking for the prime minister, she spoke for the prime minister, and there was a con see what she had was there was a consequence, yes, you know, and people understood it. What we've had is under Jacinda's le 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 leadership. A style which worked for a while, yeah, you know, it worked for a while, and people liked it and things. But what you had would we be kind, right? People like that, like yeah. being kind. But there's the other part of it internally. There needs to be some teeth too, yeah, you know. And you got to kind of, and then she'd have errant MPs, and they were just cautioned, and she put people into positions who shouldn't have been there because she wants to be kind and doesn't want to hurt people's feelings. You're running a bloody country. Yeah. You know? So what we had was MPs had no consequence. And so, you know, you've created, and under Chris Fitkins as well, right, there's still an element of that, and he's had to pay the price for it because what it shows is weak leadership. One thing New Zealanders don't like is weakness. We've never liked weakness. Look at the leaders that we've had. You know, Robert Muldoon, very strong. David Longy, very strong. Yeah. Um, you know, Jenny Shipley, Helen Clark, yeah, very strong leaders. And then we've sort of got the mealy mouthed ones after the Helen Clark. Well, I think, yeah, I think I, I think that, that that's right, and I think that's a, a a culture which you know it's got to have both. You know, it's like you know. It's gentle or it's not gentle, you know, because you've got to get results. It's like when I do negotiations with big employees or with criminal yeah. employees or exploiters, you always are polite and think until you're not. Mm -hmm. right? And I was yeah. on a call with someone this morning. He said, look, I work with good faith, yeah. but now you're not working with good, good, good faith, so now I'm going to burn the house down. <laughs> and then I'm going to follow through, right? You don't bluff. So there will be a consequence. So... What in politics, these, these, you know, with Stuart Nash, who I don't have so much blame, blame for, but there was two steps, you know, before yeah. he's pushed down. You had, you had, um, Lee Curran was another and one. Lee Curran, they get chance after chance. Yeah. You know, and I used to say to some, uh, in the past, you know, that sometimes you've got to hang someone in the village square so that everyone all understands, <laughs> you know, is that, you know, you've got to, you know, if you don't have discipline, and one of the things when I went down with the Labour Party in 2014, as you said, in the election year, which they were going to lose, yeah. it's full of factionalisation, division, yeah. factionalisation. And I thought, well, I don't know. I know, you know, most of those guys, they all think I've got horns and tail. Good, I'll make it work. So my thing was to stop them from 
start fighting each other, you know, yeah. undermining it, 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 each other. And my my thing was simple, is that I would talk to them about their responsibilities to the people who put them there. Yeah. It wasn't about them. There are people who vote for them no matter what because they believe in them. Yeah. And they betray them by working on their little van, that van piece, who's up and who's down, who's got to think. Now, that didn't work for most of them, but they all got the message of a moral responsibility. And when there was a leak or undermining, I'd go and see them. Yeah. And I'd call them out on it. I'd say, look, this has been going on and you've been accused of this. I didn't do it. Good, I believe you. Good, yeah. excellent. Well, I'm not going to call you a liar, right? Mm. But I'm going to leave now and assure the lead that it wasn't you. Oh, but brother or sir, sir, sister, I, I don't have to do this again, eh? We don't have to do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it stopped. That's it, right. But that's because there was consequences. And that that seems to me to be the major floor of MMP is that there are not the electoral consequences that there used to be for doing appalling things. You know, the Labour Party suffered that in in uh, in 1990, you know, after six years of, of the Douglas years uh, and all of the, the you know, things that happened then, there was a, a consequence for that and it was a landslide election victory. Yeah, well, that's what that Exactly right, and that's what you've got to always be a bit. It's the sort of thing is, you know, when you do party politics, right? You have a responsibility for, you know, to do it collectively and to, yeah. you know, if you sign up for it, you do your bloody job. You know, I, 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 you know, that you and I are free agents now, so we can do whatever we like, right? We can say whatever we like, and that's fine, and that's how we should be. But once you take a collective gold and you work for them, then you have a responsibility. You don't go to lies, but you just do your bloody job, you know? And yeah. Um, and I don't think that some DMPs they actually think that it's a privilege for us to have them, you know, not the other way around, you know? And every MP should always wake up. Each one say, what a privilege. What a privilege to do this job. And I get paid to do it. Mostly yeah. the actually, they do it as volunteers, you know? Most, and, mostly they look in the mirror and go, aren't I great? Well, Unfortunately, there's now no, but most of them are actually quite fearful. Yeah. You know? um, I mean, there's, a, I don't mind the ambitious. Um, um, well, they make things happen, don't they, Matt? Yeah, well, they want to prove themselves. So I like those ones because they can hold them to account. It's those who are fearful and all they do is scared about, you know, I think that some of them got an imposter um, um, in, in the head day. Probably say that they shouldn't be there. I mean, you know this, right? It's about a third of the MPs um, do the work, do yep. the leadership. About a third are okay, you know, yep. will be solid, you know, and all be stars, but they get the job done. And the other third are. Of... Do you think, what are they doing here? Yeah, they're not fit they... for man or beast, are they, mostly? No. And so, and when you've got a party with a long tail, then that's going to show. But you can cope with, with, with a third of big bats. I always say, well, this is what you get in a representative, a representative society, 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 society that, you, that, that even the dumb uh, are allowed to have some representatives here. So, you know, that's how I can cope with it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this election is shaping up to be critical, perhaps one of the most important elections in my you lifetime, mean, in your lifetime. Um, you mean unlike every other election, which is which they say the same thing? Well, they, you're right. They do say the same thing, you know, and, and I look back on them and I think, you know, and this is what people say, if we've got to get rid of this government because otherwise this country is lost or whatever, and I sit there and think, well, yeah, they said that at the end of the Douglas Longy years. They said that at the end of the Jim Bolger years. We said that at the end of the Helen Clark years. And I look back on those battles and I think compared to where we're at today, they were nothing. And I, I am genuinely fearful about the future of New Zealand for the first time in my life. Is, we said all those things in the past, but we've seen – Governments use the fearsome powers of the state against its own citizens, and there wasn't very much pushback on that at all, and that frightens me. Yeah, I was a bit surprised by that too. And I think um, 
and I think it's not just in this country, I think it's around, around the world. Um, and you think that's the main sort of issue for the solution? I think that we've seen a flipping of the roles, and you alluded to it earlier, saying that, you know, free speech and freedoms and rights and all of those sorts of things used to be the wheelhouse of of the left. You know, some of the great advances that we've made in human rights have, have come from, you know, those left-wing parties. Oh, no, that's right. They challenged the right to speak. Exactly. You know, Martin you know, Luther King, you know, I mean, look at Mandela. I mean, if they were off the free speech until the state oppressed them, then they turned to more violent means. Yeah. And we, we've got this situation happening now where we've got, you know, in the United States, we've we've seen collusion between the federal government and tech companies to silence people simply for having a differing opinion. We, we've had the advent of that here in New Zealand. We've got, you know, uh, this hate speech laws. We've even look, got individuals like Nikki Hager, for example, who who wrote a book, in my case, because he wanted me silenced mm. because I had a different point of view and a different uh, outlook on life. And that concerns me more than almost anything else, that we we haven't learned any of the lessons that we had from history where totalitarianism never ends well. No. And yet we dabbled with that and enthusiastically jumped on board that as a nation. And yeah. and that concerns me. And, and for that reason, and it's my view that this actually really is important because we're, we're at a crossroads here. We can either continue down the path to what I see as destruction with separatism with uh, the inability, you know, polarization, all of those sorts of things, or we draw a line under that. But the problem with drawing a line under that is just, well, who do you support? Because all the parties that are currently in the parliament were all on board with it. Mm. And it leaves me with a dilemma, like, you know, who do you support? You can't even look at David Seymour and the ACT Party with without being suspicious because they were all on board all of that as well. That you, that the only difference was that they would be more efficient at stomping on our on our freedoms. <laughs> well, yeah, you raise a good point, and 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 um and I I don't have the answer for it, right? Because I think it's been a um I I, I think um you know I, I go back to um the comedian um. Who took over from Noah? Um, you know, the South African comedian who took over from on, on the Daily Show. Uh, John, John, what's his name? Oh, yeah. no, no, anyway, um, but he, um, it'll come to me. God, I don't know why I, I, um, I, I can't. Uh, Trevor Noah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so he said it under, he's South African. And he said an interesting thing that when um, Mandela came and they had the Truth and Reconciliation um, uh, proposals, and yes. no one was going to be sent to jail if they told the truth, right? And he yep. says that created a very healthy environment where people could discuss things openly. And he said that racism was addressed, and people, yep, no, it exists. We don't get into denial. And he goes, the South African political dialogue was better than America. Yeah. Because there's a suppression all the time. He goes, there wasn't that, you know, first time. And that stopped the civil war. And that's a clear example, you know, by people saying, okay, we don't know how we're going to get through through this, right? And they got through it. You know, not great, but they got through it. Yeah. And so my thing is, is that I'm never afraid of someone else's speech, and nor should anyone. Right, you know, and you just, you know, if you disagree and you think it's really bad, then you have a right and you have a responsibility to engage, engage right? and challenge and, and offer your own ideas. That's how society it develops, right? Always, and there is a lot of things can they go okay, racism or separatism or other things, and that's a two-way street too. And some people's might good debate it. We're grown ups, you know, and um, and we'll change e each other's views, and um, we'll have an outcome. So. I think that all debate is healthy, and unless you agree, agree with it, the better it is. 
you know, and that's how society it can't change it. And it stops us from undercurrent. It stops us from having a very unhealthy society of fear. And in the end, the state, and I say this from some experience, right? I mean, in different worlds. In the employment world that I work in, I'm constantly suppressed to protect yep. those with power who've been exploiting. And they have all these agreements are confidential. It's the whole thing's a rot. So yep. all employment law is done on no admission of guilt, and it's all kept in confidential. Why? Yep. You know, and the thing is, is that if people knew what people were doing, then they would change. They just see this all as a racket. And there's a whole industry of people suppressing those who are poor and vulnerable, and they get away with it. It's just a racket, all protected by by the state. So that's the extreme example, but it can go everywhere. Yeah. And so I I ignore the suppression. So it's a bit of a history that you have in common. So I was even threatened with a suppression or, or, or order last week. Yeah. I said, I'll write about it. I don't care. Then they backed off. Yeah. You know, I get about six suppression cases or, you know, li- liable cases a year. Yeah. About every two months I get them, you know, and I just see them and send it back with the F off, sort of on it, <laughs> and, um, and I don't hear from them again because it's just, it's all to intimidate shutting people up to intimidate them from speaking their truth. The poor or those with a different view from those who rule us, the only thing they have is their voice. And they must have their voice. And that's where the media have let down society because they've become part of the state's apparatus and in in silencing points of view that they uh, deem to be... um, not in the best interests of whoever. Well, what it is, is you know, right? It's a very middle class thing you know, of sensitivity and saying, I need to be protected by your ideas because mm. you're confronted with What they're really saying is that those ideas are challenging and I don't have an answer for that, so you have to shut up. I think that's an extreme thing, but yes. <laughs> but, 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 but I... I Look, I deal with a lot of the lefties, right? And yep. when I talk about lefties, I come from a working class left. <laughs> you call a spade a spade, you know, and you say what you think. Yeah. What we have now, I think, is more of a liberalism, you know, a liberal left, if you like, a yep. middle class left, and their feelings are more important. Yeah. And I just said, but your feelings are not a reason that I can't say what I think, you yep. know? And... Um, you know, you can't be protected from other people's ideas, but they think they can. And um, I think it's become very extreme and I think unhealthy. Oh, well, no, I think I know it's unhealthy. And, um, and um, you know, I, I just will support all occasions for workers to have free speech, which shouldn't even be... Shouldn't something. even be... Shouldn't even be arguing about it. It should... No. should. You know, no, we, because in um, in the states, of course, with the um, Southern Poverty Centre, the, the Southern the, Poverty Law Centre, Law Centre, they used to defend Nazis, right? Mm. Because, they, you know, because they said the right to speak is important for all people, including you know their main focus is on on black people. But yeah. they knew that by defending all right to speech, that was the way that you could deal with racism. Yeah. You know? And, yep. um, you know, tell the truth. And I said before, as I said before, you know, for those without power, the only thing they have is their voice. And those with power want to close those vo- vo- voices down for their own re- reasons. And I think that needs to be fought. And that's the reason why the founding fathers of the United States had the First Amendment being the right to free speech. Absolutely. And the Second Amendment was the right to be armed to protect the right to free speech. Yes, I think that's been misconstrued a bit, but anyway, that's a whole different debate. But um, it is, um, you know, um, yeah. But yeah, it, I think it might be more an important sort of issue than 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 a philosophical one. Um, these kids run sort of run 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 around with machine guns, sort of mowing down their classmates. So yeah, that's, yeah. That's it, what fathers were thinking. That's right. What's Matt McCartan's prediction for this election? I think I a roundup to final to 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 wrap yeah. this all up. No, no, Where are we I heading, think, Matt? I think it'll be close. I think it'll be close there. 
Uh, I think that lay lay with their two own goals with Kerry and Michael Wood. I think that's um, done them some damage the way they managed it. But I think that uh, Chris Luxton has got a glass jaw. Yeah. I think in the debates, I think that Chris Hipkins Hip- will dominate that. Yeah. And and all governments say don't don't put it at risk. I don't think that National has earned its right to be government this time. I think this thing. I think that the Maori Party are going to keep the, the Labour Party in. So I think um, it'll be close. I think it'll be within two or three seats one way or the other. If Labour runs a good campaign, they, they could pull it off. If they if an election was done today, of course, that they'd lose. Yeah. But, um, you know, what Labour are good at that the Nats are not good, 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 good at, they do early voting really well. Yes. And I think that that may make a difference. If the Māori Party can pull off four seats, or maybe even get to five, five, five percent of polls. I think then that's going to make the difference. Well, so I have we'll, to put a we'll know in a few now. short weeks, won't we? Well, I have to put a dollar on it now. I go for a Labour lead by a inch. Well, I reckon it's harder to pick than a broken nose. I agree, but I think you asked me to make a pick, so I'll make a pick. <laughs> Good on you. Thanks so much for coming on The Crunch with me uh, today, Matt, and I hope that's given listeners a bit of an understanding about how you and I have have operated behind the scenes to to actually make some things happen. All right, brother. Thank you so much. Like Morris Williamson, Matt McCartan has some great yarns to share about his roles in the trenches of New Zealand politics. I hope you enjoyed hearing his pearls of wisdom as much as I enjoyed talking about them with him. Check out our brand new RCR Foundation Members Club. Go to www.realitycheck.radio slash members and join now. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR Reality Check Radio Mark Mitchell is a former police dog handler has worked in the Gulf setting up and protecting a global logistics company and now is the national MP for Rodney as well as Nationals Police Spokesman he's with me now to discuss the latest spate in gang and gun crime It seems to be troubling our society with a far greater frequency than ever before. Mark, welcome to The Crunch. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Cam. No problem, Mark. Look, we seem to have this moving feast of negative headlines involving gangs, guns, gun crime, violence, uh, gangs taking over the city just this week alone. We're looking at uh, a shooting in Point England, which has cost the life of somebody. We've got uh, a gang killing in Palmerston North, which in, apparently is a de-patching. It seems to be, instead of taking the patch off somebody's back, it looks like they've shot somebody. We've got another shooting in, in the CBD in Auckland a week after we've had the, the terrible tragedy uh, downtown as well. And now we've got on uh, Tuesday afternoon another gang taking over um, Auckland City uh, so they can have a funeral for one of their scumbag mates. What's National going to do about this, Mark? Well, I think, number one, Cam, the reason why you've just read out a laundry list of shame for the country... That's just um, this week. ...is because six years ago... Well, that's right. Um, You know, we've seen headlines around the country just on a weekly basis now in terms of gang violence and firearms violence. I mean, you know, I won't even start with the amount of unreported cases, firearms incidents that actually aren't reported through the media. I mean, the day that we had that um, tragedy unfold in downtown Auckland, there was a further five firearms incidents that day that that went unreported um, in the media. So just to give you a sort of a snapshot and understanding of what our frontline police are actually dealing with at the moment. Look, the reality of it is, is that... uh, you had a, um, a, a soft-on-crime Labor government come into power six years ago, and uh, there are only two priorities in our criminal justice system, was quite simply reducing the prison muster by 30% and, um, and repealing the only tough piece of sentencing law that we had on our books, and that was the three-strikes legislation, which, by the way, was working. And so we've got a, a, a legacy of those two decisions, emptying the prisons. Who would have thought that crime would have skyrocketed if you empty the prisons? 
Oh, exactly, exactly. So they, they, that's one of the few things that they have been successful at doing and set themselves targets on, and that was a reduction of the prison muster, and they've actually reduced that by about 20%. Um, yeah, but look, the, the reason why I mention that is because that was the um, ideology that was brought into the government by this government. And um, uh, the, the fact of the matter is they've created a very permissive environment for adult gangs to sort of flourish and operate with impunity. And, of course, you've seen a, a big increase in, in serious violent retail offending by these um, youth and juvenile offenders. And then, of course, the, the other thing they've done is they've victimised gun owners, uh, confiscated firearms, uh, and uh, taken them off law-abiding people, and at the same time brought in this gun register on the premise that it's um, it's going to reduce gun crime. Can you see that actually succeeding the way the police have sold it to us? Well, there's, there's got to be a balance here. So that, so it's completely out of balance in terms of this government, without a doubt, have gone after our law-abiding firearms and hunting community, which is a big part of our history as a country. I'm a very keen recreational hunter myself. And um, and there's things there. There's, there's a whole bunch of over-regulation. There's things that they've done to sort of target the the part of our firearms community that's not the problem uh, instead of the gangs and the organised crime. The the balancing and the other, the flip side to that, Cam, is quite simply this. The evidence that's been given to uh, the Justice Select Committee, which I sit on, is yeah. it's quite clear that we have got a problem in New Zealand with um, licensed firearms or fire, people that, that hold a firearms licence that are receiving money from gangs that are going into gun stores and buying them on order, straw man sales, and then passing them on to um, unlicensed um, uh, people, uh, i.e. the gangs and, and organised crime. Now, the evidence is that the only way to be able to clamp down that and, and stop that um, straw, those straw man sales is a register. Where if a um, if one of these uh, uh, one of these licensed firearm holders, who by the way, is uh, the the actual the legal the, everyone in our firearms community that actually is doing things right, they need to be protected from them because it's it's uh, they need to be purged uh, because they end up uh, impacting the you know everyone that has a firearms license. Um, but basically, Cam, the register is quite simply this: is that. The only way to stop those straw band sales is to have the, the firearm registered against the buyer and the police or whoever the regulator might be, because actually I don't feel that the police is the right regulator. There is a clear conflict of interest there. Yep. Um, they are able to go and audit those firearms. And if you've got a firearms license holder that's bought 20 firearms and, and, a, and an auditor turns up and they've only got 10, then there's going to be a fast track into prison. Um, and, and some serious questions asked, where are the other 10 firearms? Because but at the they, moment, they're ending up in the hands of gangs. But will they, though? I mean, you know, um, registers have worked, haven't worked anywhere in the world. Canada was was the most famous example. They spent a billion dollars trying to implement their register and then ditched it because it just doesn't stop anything. The second thing about that is that these people who are doing this and converting these firearms are criminals. and we're passing laws to, that are already in place, uh, essentially, to say that you can't sell guns to unlicensed people, but they're doing it already. So all we're doing is... But well, they, they, they are criminals, but they're criminals that have got firearms licences. Yeah, but what's going to happen is, and I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen, all it means is that the gangs will pay more money for their guns now because there's a consequence for the person getting caught, and so that person will want recompense for that. And so it's not actually going to stop criminals getting guns, uh, it, but it is going to put a massive amount of paperwork in place, which is all this, the system is already um, creaking and groaning under the the, the changes to the license re- regimes. Um, you know they're spending two hundred and twenty million dollars on the gun register, um, building an empire yeah, well, we, uh, with we, it, which yes, they so call we, a we, business unit. We've said. Well, we, we've said that those costs seem excessive, and we've said that we want a very narrow register um, where there aren't massive cost blowouts and, and it's reasonable cost. But we do want to protect the firearms community by making sure that, that they've got they've got bad eggs in there that have got firearms licences that are buying guns for gangs. And um, and the register is the one way to be able to clamp down on that. That's the evidence that's been put in front of us. Apparently, they've been successful in Australia. And um, and we and unfortunately, like you said, we've got way too much gun violence in this country at the moment. Now we've got to stop the other. Um, you know, obviously there's other supply chains, there's other ways 
of getting contraband into the country um, and firearms into the hands of uh, gang members, and, and we've got to go after them. But it's clearly, when you saw the case for the Bay of Plenty that was reported last week mm. with a um, high-profile ex-international rugby player that was given $10,000 by the Comancheros yep. as payment to go and buy a whole lot of firearms. Now, he, he, was, he, has a license, he had a firearms licence. Yep. So, you know, within the community itself, many people that I talk to, some of my very good friends up in Warwick who are collectors, and they're not against the register because they feel that a register might actually be effective in being able to um, flush these people out, the ones but, that have got firearms licences and are giving everyone else a bad reputation. Yeah, collectors and pistol users have been in a, in a register anyway, and, and any one of us, and I'm a collector myself, we can point, and, and, yeah. and this came up in a recent inspection at my house, the police came round and accused me of disposing of a firearm illegally. Yep. This, this, with that act, and this was the existing register in place, and I had, and yep. they treated me like I was a criminal. And the actual problem was actually at their end in not processing some paperwork, and uh, I w- I had to produce right. the paperwork to show them that they hadn't done their job. And then, but they still treated me like a criminal for about an hour or so, uh, assuming that I had sold a pistol to a criminal. <laughs> so yeah, look, we've, been, we've, we've been very, very yeah, we've been very clear. I was very clear in a meeting with the minister and the um, police leading the work on the register that um, that the protection of information was paramount and it had to be proven that they could do that, and that would um, that our support would be dependent on showing that they could do that. And of course, um, two that weeks information after must it, be held securely. Two weeks after it launched, yep, so we've got a data breach. Yep, yep, and and that and that was totally unacceptable. The email that went out. So look, they they have to show it. They're serious about it, and they can yep. do that. And of course, we said the other caveat was around cost. But um, but look, at, at the end of the day, um, Cam, the reality is this: is that the advice that we have got is that this will help make our frontline police officers safer, and it will help make the public safer. And I actually firmly believe as someone that doesn't hold a, a current firearms licence but has in the past and, mm-hmm. uh, and has spent a lot of time hunting and rec- as a recreational hunter, yeah. is that this will actually protect our firearms community as well because we want to flush out the ones, we want to flush out the irresponsible ones that are holding firearms licences and buying them on order uh, to the gangs and, and organised crime. We want to get on top of them. And, um, and although I understand that there's some resistance uh, and it's been challenged within the community, and I totally get that, um, there's also a lot in the farms community that support um, the idea of having a register and being able to to flush these people out. The the, the other issue is this: is that um, is that we're going to appoint a, a hunting and fishing minister. Todd McClay holds the portfolio at the moment, yeah. so that the um, so that our firearms community, whether it be gun clubs, um, which of course are often family intergenerational, um, you know, important clubs as part of the community, or whether it be our hunting and fishing community, feel like they have a strong voice and representation. Um, yeah. Around the cabinet table, um, which which I think they feel has been missing up to this point. Um, been, been so missing you know, for but, a long but, time, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and look, and by the way, coming back to your situation, is that you know I actually strongly feel that um, that the police aren't the right agency to be uh, to be the regulator um, no. because there, there's a clear conflict of interest there, which you can understand because you know they were they're all about they completely focused on um, on public Criminals. safety, yeah. Um, in yeah. the in the news reports on Tuesday about the Hell's Angel funeral for the ex president of yeah. Hell's Angel, the the police have said that they've invoked new legislation to disrupt gang activity, giving of officers powers to search vehicles and occupants of vehicles of suspected gang members, and this is the important part: to seize their weapons during times of conflict. That seems a bit ass backwards, don't you think, Mark? Shouldn't we be seizing their weapons at all times? Yeah, absolutely. Um, look, you know, this is the government that passed the firearms pro- prohibition order that had no warrantless search powers for police. And uh, both the police association and ourselves at the time through the select committee process said that if you don't have that power for the police, then it's not worth the paper it's written on. It's been, um, it's been available to the police now, or it's been available now for the courts to use for 10, 10, 11 months, and I think there's been two orders um, used, so it just shows how ineffective it's actually been. Um, 
But yeah, the, 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 the point that I'd make here, Cam, is that there's already plenty of laws and, and, and um, you know, defences contained within the Crimes Act and the Summary Offences Act and, and the Arms Act for the police to act now. Um, but it's got to, there's got to be a will to be able to clamp down and police the gangs hard, and that will has to be driven out of PNHQ yep. and, um, and then sort of um, down through the districts, and I just don't think that that will has been there. And, and I think also a, a key problem is that the courts don't seem to have a will to prosecute people for gun crime because uh, well, you know, the, we see this yeah. every week. Every week there's a news article about somebody who's done something with a firearm. Uh, you know, firearms owners like myself say, well, well, the maximum penalty for that seven years in prison, and you find out they've got a slap on the hand with a wet bus ticket, um, a thoroughly soaked wet, wet bus ticket, I might add, and they they don't even end up with uh, often with anything other than fines, and we've got the laws yeah, look, in not, place, but the yeah. courts won't apply them. Look, I'm not going to argue with that. That without a doubt, this government sends signals to our judiciary um, that uh, you know they wanted the prison must be reduced and to avoid prosecution. So, you know, they, 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 and and it, you know they do take look. It's very important to highlight that our in our democracy, uh, which is still one of the best in the world. The judiciary is independent, and um, and we shouldn't be interfering with them. And it's very important that they maintain that. But they do take signals from the government of the day. There's no doubt about that. And this government has very clearly signalled that they want um, that they want slaps on the wrist with a wet bus ticket. And that's what's happened. And, and two of the biggest deterrents for offending is number one, the likelihood of being caught, and number two, the consequences sitting behind being caught. And um, and in this country at the moment. Neither of this, you've got a very low likelihood of being caught and there's no consequences sitting there. And that's a big part of what's fueling this violent crime that we're currently seeing around the country, you know, led by the gangs. You're an ex-cop and uh, I'm pretty sure that the police wouldn't mind having you as their minister. Um, but criminals are not that smart. It, you know, would you agree with that in your experience? They're not that smart. And so... Some are, some aren't. Yeah, I think that you know the the, the reality of, of it now, Cam, is that these adult gangs now are quite sophisticated in the way they operate. Yes, um, but but when a, it comes part down of big to global, um, yeah. yeah, when it comes down to tin tacks, though, they react to signals that they're getting, and if society is saying, "Well, actually, we don't care if we've got a prison muster of ten thousand people, we just don't want those people on the streets." And so if you commit violent crimes, you're going straight to jail for a good long time. And uh, and we don't care if you rot in jail. And then they adjust their behaviour and their attitude. Yeah, so look, you, you sort of raised sentencing, and, um, and and I didn't really answer your question on that. Look, mm. the reality is this, is that, is that we do feel very strongly that um, the, serious, the consequences need to match the seriousness of the offending. And one of the things that we have done is we announced a policy about three or four weeks ago that we would cap the discounts that the judge can apply to a sentence at 40%. Um, and by that, what I mean is that often when they come in front of a judge for sentencing, they might start with a sentence of six years and then they'll get discount, uh, discounted down for showing some remorse or um, or an early guilty plea or a, or, or a cultural report. And all of a sudden, they're, they're discounted down below the two years and then they're, they're eligible for home detention. And uh, we've seen an increase of 158% of pe- people on home detention in the last six years. Um, still whilst the at the community. same time, you've seen almost 100. That's right. That's right. And, and a lot of the violent incidents and, and unnecessary deaths, that, homicides that we've had recently have been um, di- directly attributable to people that shouldn't have been out on home detention. Wouldn't having minimum sentences be um, a way to stop the judges discounting? Where you say, well, you've used a firearm in the, co- in the commission of this crime. That's straight away three years in prison. No discounts. No look, possibility of look, doing it, it. Yeah, look, at the end of the day, Paul Goldsmith has got the justice portfolio. That is under his sort of um, uh, remit. But he has he has come out publicly and said that we will look at the Sentencing Act um, if we need to, to make sure that the, um, that, the, that the sentences are matching the seriousness of the offender. Well, that sounds like a... A, a, a perfect opportunity to make a, a clear differential between the national party and every other party, if you if you actually looked at the sentencing act and did consider minimum sentences rather than maximum sentences. Yeah, look, 
on a personal note, you sort of alluded to the fact that I had a policing career. Very, very proud of my policing career. I spent 14 years mm. in the job, most of it on the dog section and in, in the armed defender squad. And I did that because I wanted to serve my community and I wanted to keep them safe, just like just about any, any police officer that joins the police wants to do. And I have been, um, I have sat by and had a, unfortunately had a front row seat uh, watching this present government take us completely in the wrong direction. I've never seen the levels of violence and lawlessness that we're currently experiencing as a country. And I am determined, um, if we are lucky enough to win the election on October 14, to do everything that I can and provide the leadership that I can from the National Cabinet to try and turn that round and get us heading back in the right direction in terms of being the safest, being aspirational about being the safest country in the world rather than being an, a, an embarrassment, which we are at the moment. So, I mean, it is an embarrassment, really. We've, we've got... You know, tourists we want wanting to invite back into the country, and yet downtown Auckland, you, know, you, you can talk to anybody. Nobody wants to go there anymore. There's just there's just crime uh, coming out our ears, and there seems to be no willingness to actually um, put rat bags in jail. Well, you know what? The, the funny thing about that, and this has just been always been my own personal um, gauge of how safe a country is, is how safe their capital city is or their or their major city. So Auckland is, our, is not our capital city, but it's certainly our major international city, and that's how it's viewed and seen. Yeah. And uh, if we can't secure and keep our CBD safe, um, then that's a sad indictment on us. And, and when I say us, it's not actually a sad indictment on us. It's a sad indictment on this Labor government. Um, and, and is it an embarrassment? Look, I was overseas recently for the wedding of one of my best mate's um, daughter, and while I was overseas... Um, as normally a very proud Kiwi, uh, we had a potiki taken over by the gangs. And people there were saying to me, how can, how in New Zealand can you have one of your towns taken over by the gangs? Um, you know, look, the reality of it is we've just had our Justice Minister um, arrested for um, failing to accompany police. Yeah, doing it uh, right. You know, I mean, it's just... Yeah, and, and look, I'm sorry, but um, on the, on the um, international stage, and this was reported all around the world by the media... Um, it is a terrible, it makes us look like a banana republic. Um, you, you imagine the comments that would be made if it was a, um, if it was a, if it was a British justice minister or Australian justice minister or, or a Canadian or a US um, you know, secretary. It, was, it would be, I don't know, it's just, for me, Cam, when you look at the, those two examples I've given you, yep. gangs taking over uh, you know, one of our provincial towns, a justice minister uh, winding up in, in police cells, um, you know, the amount of shootings that we've seen uh, in the last week, we are a shambles um, yeah. when it comes to law and order. We've got to get it fixed. And our, and our own media excuse it all away, saying that um, the Justice Minister was a victim of racism and misogyny. You know, nobody forced her to drink all that well, booze and drive drunk. Well, I'm, I'm not even going to enter into that debate. At the end of the day, what, what I'm quite simply saying is this. Is that it's a New Zealand justice minister, and yeah. um, there is no circumstances that excuses that sort of behaviour. No, Wairoa was a gang town when you were a police officer. Was it a gang town when you left Wairoa? So Wairoa always had a heavy gang presence, um, but that Wairoa's always had some pretty good local leadership through the mayor, and uh, I used to get called down there on a regular basis along with. Um, Myself and the other AOS dog handler, Kevin Weatherly, would often get called down there when the gang started to play up. Um, the difference, and we used to get called to Wara. We used to ask, we used to get called to a Potiki as well. The difference then, Cam, was that when we rolled into town with the dog vans, um, the gangs would scuttle back down to the holes that they'd sort of come from uh, because they knew that we meant business and we knew they knew that we were going to give the town that we served a sense that we were controlling the streets and not them. Um, but now it's uh, you know I watch with dismay when I see police officers standing on the side of the road, videoing them on their phones um, and uh, providing um, traffic control while they take over the streets, hanging out of their vehicles, sitting on them, abusing, giving the police fingers, abusing and intimidating members of the public. Um, this is where we've got to, and it's completely, totally unacceptable. And national is going to end that. Well, that's the, there's going to be a directive coming straight, firing straight down to the commissioner's office on day one that we are not going to see gangs taking over public roads anymore and law, our law-abiding citizens in this country are going to have their rights um, uh, reinforced rather than the gangs. 
maybe we need a commissioner that doesn't have the nickname Cuddles. <laughs> yeah, well, no comment on that. <laughs> All right, on that note, Mark, thank you very much for coming on The Crunch and talking about law and order and the mayhem that's on our streets, and hopefully we get you as the police minister and get you to uh, sort out the gang problems like you used to do in Wairau. Yeah, thanks, Tay. Listen, thanks for having me on uh, to all your listeners. And, um, and look, we'll be working as hard as we can to change this government on uh, October 14th. All right. Well, it's not far away, and uh, hopefully we've got something to celebrate uh, with the end of this crime-friendly regime. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Cheers, Mark. Thanks a lot. I want to thank Mark for coming on The Crunch. He's the first national MP to show the courage to come on the show. He certainly showed us a good grasp of the issues that are leading to the crime wave currently enveloping the nation and has the necessary policing skills to rattle the right cages to get some much-needed action. I'm not sure he's on the right track with the gun register, though, so we may have to get him back to discuss that in more details. You're listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater, right here on RCR. Reality Check Radio. Now it's time for Cam's Buddies. I've decided to share with you how I get impartial advice about issues by calling a few of my mates. Most of them are non-political, and we've known each other for over 20 years. I regularly catch up with these mates, and they always give me their unvarnished views on anything. My producer has them all lined up and ready to go. Let's hear what Cam's buddies have to say about letting BlackRock in to build a climate change fund for a cosy $2 billion. Good afternoon, Paul. Welcome to Cam's buddies. Good afternoon, Cam. So you might have seen the news on Tuesday that the uh, Labour Party has announced a climate infrastructure fund of $2 billion in conjunction with the globalist finance company, BlackRock. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's a little bit concerning. I think um, BlackRock is worth something in the order of $10 trillion. It's one of the biggest asset management um, companies in the world. And I don't think too many of our folk would be mentally equipped to negotiate with them. I think we'd be thinking we're getting a good deal if we get some... Um, land for some muskets or something like that. But that'll be that style of trade. These people are far smarter than the, the best New Zealand's got, I would be pretty sure about. So what BlackRock wouldn't be doing this for for a Big Mac chips and a Coke or out of the goodness of their heart, would they? I wouldn't think so. I mean, if I remember rightly, BlackRock, um, they were divesting themselves of coal and um, natural gas type assets when the price was, I don't know, $80 a tonne. Now that the price with the war is $380 a tonne, they're saying, oh, no, we need to be a bit more shareholder focused. So they're getting back involved in it. And I think um, their leader, I think Larry Fink, I think is the the number one, Um, he's a smart, smart guy. And um, they're going to do stuff for money. And I don't think... Megan Woods, for example, our energy minister, would have a clue with how to negotiate with such people. We've kind of, kind of got a, a devil's dilemma, though. We've got the National Party on one hand that's promising to use vast sums of CCP cash, and now we've got the Labour Party wanting to use vast sums of BlackRock's cash. Isn't this something that we would be better off building the capacity for sovereign investment in New Zealand? Well, I'm really concerned about environmental social governance, and I think BlackRock is very much down the path of saying, we will own your country and we'll show you how to do it. And so that once you let them in the door, um, you could find there's a whole lot of policies that come with it that we don't want to miss out on the, the next branch of money that they may want to put our way. So we lose our sovereignty to people that were never elected and never likely to be. 
because they're about the money. Yeah, I have a real problem with uh, how they throw these numbers around, like, oh, it's $2 billion. And then nobody in the media seems to cross-reference that to how much they spent on the COVID response and, you know, whatever it was, $50 million or $55 mil, uh, billion. Um, it sound, $2 billion then sounds like chicken feed. We've got a hole in the in the budget in with the government's finances right now of about twenty billion, and um, I fear that we've got a whole bunch of dolts that are out there looking at this and going, "Oh, you know, bring it on! It's only two billion." Yeah, well, in my view, what we're we're doing is we're we're sort of allowing these people to say the world won't deal with us unless we're so woke that we're the wokest people on woke day. The, the world won't deal with it, so we have to be greener than green. And any time you're number one in business at doing something, if you do it well and it's really successful, other people will copy for a tenth the money. And if you do it poorly, as many first cab off the ranks do do it poorly, they think, oh, other people will learn from your mistakes and do it better having watched the failures that you did. So I think being first to that level by 2050 of, you know, net zero or um, fossil, free, fossil fuel free, I think we're aiming at something that, and they say, oh, we're less than 1%. Less than 1%, we're less than 0.1 of 0.1 of a percent. They, yeah. they, they tell us what we're doing, the difference we make is huge. Um, and then they say, all these, all these other people won't deal with us. Well, who are they? Is it Australians that won't deal with us? Is it Americans that won't deal with us? Chinese? The Chinese that Indians? won't deal with us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you look and you think, who is it that won't deal with us? Well, it's some fool somewhere that, um, that and, and is the science settled is the, is the next question. I mean, they're saying all, all 65 million scientists think this. Well, that's not how science works. And having... Um, Chippy saying, the yeah, best thing we've ever done is, is um, take this $2, million, $2 billion worth and invest it in companies in New Zealand. We all know some of the biggest money made was when the likes of telecom went private. The likes of the, the different power infrastructure companies went private. Mm. So if this is a company investing in an in a energy infrastructure in New Zealand, and getting it in cheaply through the the back door or the or the side door or whatever door Chippy's letting them in, it's it's like why don't we build some of this stuff instead of spending billions of dollars on that we could just manufacture out of um, Grant Robertson's hole? Why don't we get some some money that and invest it in infrastructure and then see see what it can and would do without having. Um, the crumbs off a plate of a ten trillion dollar company that turns over sort of between ten and a hundred times what New Zealand does. Yeah, it seems to be a very um, big risk in almost letting the wolf in the door. Um, and the, in that snapping sound is uh, is them licking their chops at um, at a whole bunch of uh, you know uh, antipodean um, idiots. That when it comes to global finance, well, I think that that, that they're thinking we're okay from Muskogee and they're going to take a lend. That's that's my thoughts. And when I hear Megan Woods talking about it, I think they're not far wrong. <laughs> I, th- I think you're not far wrong at all, Paul. Thanks for give- calling into Cam's buddies, and uh, those pearls of wisdom will be enjoyed by our listeners. Thanks, Cam. Take care. Eh? Talk soon. Thanks. Thank you. G'day, Marcus. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. How's it going, mate? Yeah, good. Uh, did you see the news on Tuesday that uh, Chris Hipkins, together with his pals from BlackRock, have announced a $2 billion infrastructure fund for for uh, climate mitigation and climate change uh, resolutions? What do you think about that? Well, I only found out about that today, but, um, yeah, I've got some opinion about that. <laughs> We're all ears, mate. Um, yeah, well, I mean, first of all, they should like they might as well just do a deal with the devil himself. I mean, if you're going to go out and and find um, investors and that sort of thing, it's ironic that they um, recently have been 
hassling um, National with regards to their um, private public partnership um, deal with um, roading. Next yep. minute they go and do the the mother of all private partnerships with the devil himself, BlackRock. I mean, they could be worse. They could have gone with Vanguard, I suppose. So we should be thankful for that. I mean, would it, would it Black, be worse? BlackRock. Well, hey, I mean, yeah, I don't know. They're both they're both the same, as far as I can tell. I mean, BlackRock own the world, is it? And this comes back to something I said a while back with you. Um, we we don't understand the sort of money we're talking about when we're talking about BlackRock, and this just goes to show they're playing down the globalist um, market. And they keep saying that, no, no, we're all just conspiracy theorists and that sort of thing. But, I mean, BlackRock, we, we do not, we can't comprehend how much money they own. I mean, they have, I think, back in 2020, um, just before the before the um, pandemic that came in, they owned $7.3 trillion or thereabouts of assets worldwide. Yeah, and in 2021, it jumped up now. to... Yeah, or well, 2021, it jumped up to nine, $9.5 trillion, I think it was. Mm. Um and, and, and they, I mean, I wonder how that happened. I mean, they own near on eight percent of Pfizer. <laughs> it's just, it just blows my mind, you know, that, that all what we've been told and the narrative we've been given, and then the next minute they go and do this and say, no, no, nothing to see here. We're just, you know, borrowing off the devil, and um, yeah, you, you'll be, you'll own nothing and be happy. And and I mean, and the money they're using it for, I mean, jeepers, climate change, I guess, hey. Terrible. Well, I'm someone, scared. Are you, are you scared? Oh, you, look, I, uh, my belief of climate change is I, I'm actually a big fan of global warming, and I think that it should be. <laughs> I can't, I can't it, wait. <laughs> it, sh- it should. It should be. Uh, you know, uh, every New Zealander's right to be able to grow mangoes and pineapples in their back garden, even in Invercargill in the I middle of winter. Could not agree with you more. I mean, it's it's funny, eh? Because. We go on about climate um, and carbon and all that sort of thing, and and how how we're making such a big deal with all this carbon going out into the air and that sort of thing. I, I think we're around about three hundred parts per million actually at the moment. I mean, the last ice age was parts per four four hundred three ninety. That's right. So so the last ice age was something like ten thousand parts per million or something like that. And <laughs> life ceases to exist at one hundred and eighty parts per million. So what what are we closer to? One hundred and eighty parts per million, or ten thousand parts per million? It's just ludicrous. The whole thing's ludicrous. I mean, this is something, and they're they're just wasting our money. To uh, what they're borrowing too much. How much should, how much taxpayer money is going into that? Well, I'm, I'm I would hope none, but you know, you you just never know with right. these with these fools. I mean, you know, Grant Robertson doesn't have any idea about uh, global finance, and oh, these crap. guys at BlackRock are a whole lot more. Uh, clued up when it comes to financing than Megan Woods or um, Grant Robertson. Well, Grant Robinson doesn't even think the World Economic Forum exists. He, he, I mean, your very own Peter Williams tried to interview him about the Great Reset, and and old Grant Robinson says, "Oh, I'm not here to be interviewed about, I'm oh, sorry, about um, conspiracy theorists." You know, it's just yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. Next minute, next minute, we've got Chris Hipkins uh, a couple of weeks ago meeting with Klaus Schwab himself. So, oh, oh, they, 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 honestly, they just they just think we're stupid, mate. And unfortunately, a lot of the times you're right. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a shell game. But you know, would we be any better off with National? Because Christopher Luxon's come out, uh, you know, Tuesday afternoon and said, "Well, this is fabulous. This is fantastic." And of course, he's also um, wanting to sign us up to of wages of of CCP cash. And I don't know what's worse, um, CCP cash oh, or Bla- I mean- BlackRock cash. Well, I mean, they they go on about how um, China's, you know, getting too much influence in the South Pacific with all their um, infrastructure building and and trying to dangle the carrot in front of Fiji and all the Pacific Islands and that sort of thing. Mm. And and then they go and do this with BlackRock. And exactly right. I mean, they might as well have just gone to CCP themselves and said, hey, could we borrow $2 billion? They would have gone, yeah, sure. Wouldn't have been a good look for them, though. So, you know, BlackRock's just just a company. And this this comes back to what I was saying a while back. But we're not living in the democracy we're living in anymore. Unfortunately, what's happened is business has got so big, so huge, we can't fathom the dollars, you know. Trillion dollars, one trillion, one trillion dollars, sorry, my arm's going off or something. One trillion dollars has 12 zeros after it. One million has six. And they've yeah. got like 10, nine trillion dollars worth of assets. Uh, what, what's our GDP? 120 billion? 
Yeah, we, we can't. Like we can't even. You can't tell me these businesses don't have their knees under the table of the decision makers around the world and all the all the governments and that sort of thing. We're we're being played a fool, and we're just sitting here lapping it up, and no one's doing nothing about it. And you're right. National's no better, mate. National's just another globalist party. Well, exactly. So it's a it's going to be a a real dilemma for us at the at the election. We go with the red team and BlackRock. Uh, Black Rocks billions, or we go with the blue team and the CCP billions. Unfortunately, I think it's it's all too late. They've already spent the money. You know, COVID has done its deal, and all the money's been spent. I mean, we're living on borrowed time with the US dollar. It's going to go, um, excuse my phraseology, but tits up any day. And as soon as people realise that, then that's going to usher in the CBDC, and then we're all going to be slaves to the grind. You know. And it's we're already over the cliff. We're falling. We're just waiting for the bump at the bottom. So right. I mean, now is the time for people to just prepare, I guess. And and BlackRock's uh, donkey deep in digital currencies and ESG. So you can just easily see that uh, you know if you've uh, bought too much diesel this month, there'll be uh, no access to your uh, funds for you this month. Oh, I thought- Still fully programmable, and you're only allowed so much meat per month, you know, because climate change and all that. So, I mean, yeah, it's just it's ludicrous, and and it really aches my heart because my I've got a couple of boys, and and they're not going to live in the world that I lived in when I grew up. I mean, they weren't going to anyway because of technology. But but what's happening now, and how stupid people are, just playing along, and we haven't got enough people standing up and saying no, no, won't do that, nah, mm mm. Yeah, that's we need more people to to have the guts to say no enough, and and you're not going to do that with our country. And uh, I don't think people actually realise the implications that there is in signing up with with these voracious wolves uh, who are only um, no. looking looking at their balance sheet, and not ours. Absolutely right, absolutely right. And most people don't realise until it's way too late. Like I say, we're already falling down the cliff, and people won't realise until it starts getting a bit uncomfortable when they hit the bottom and they'll be like, hang on, I didn't sign up for this. But unfortunately, you did because you were sleeping at the wheel. You weren't watching what was going on. You were watching TV3 News and you were seeing TV1 News and they're telling you everything's all good. Soon they're going to start telling us about the CBDC and how we should all be looking forward to when it comes in. And that'll be the that'll be the sign that the CBDC is coming very soon is yeah. when they start advertising it. Well, it looks like um, we've got the two major parties just wanting to sell out our country. Yep, 100%. Like I say, they're both globalists, um, and I believe that actors as well, um, based on old Seymour's um, actions of recent, I, I think he's sold out to the um, the powers that be that are pulling his strings, and we're really running out of people really quick. And I'm I'm not convinced actually, like I say, that we're living in the democracy we think we are anyway. So it's 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 frustrating and it's a bit worrying. Well, it's very sobering your thoughts there, Marcus, and uh thanks for calling into Cam's buddies. Appreciate it as usual and uh and so do the listeners. They seem to really enjoy this segment. Good stuff. All right, go thanks, out and Marcus. prepare and make sure that you're you're ready for it. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, right. Marcus. Good night, mate. See you, mate. Hello, Miles. Welcome to Cam's Buddies. Hello, Cam. How are you today? Oh, you know, flat out, like a lizard drinking. Uh, I've just been talking to a few of my other buddies uh, about the announcement on Tuesday by uh, Chris Hipkins, together with his pals from BlackRock, about a $2 billion fund for uh, climate change research and infrastructure and things like that. And just wondering what you think about that. Well, $2 billion is an awful lot of money to spend on something that will, in fact, produce expensive energy. How so? Well, if you just look over the ditch at Australia and you look at their investment into renewables, we can see that the average Australian power bills are going through the roof. And it's a... It's a shame we can't speak German, because if we could speak German, we'd be reading stories from Germany about how renewables have cost so much and put so much strain on their own power grid 
that it seems that coal-fired power stations and indeed nuclear um, power stations are being um, re-energised, as it were. Recommissioned. In the UK, they've had all of this uh, push on renewables and it seems that nobody is able to you know, join the dots that the wind doesn't always blow, the sun doesn't always shine. Yeah, well, you know, when I get home from work, it's it's dark and it's cold and I uh, turn the heater on or I turn the heat pump on. Guess what? The sun doesn't shine in the dark, not unless uh, something's happened that I haven't noticed recently. And if you have one of the fine winter days that we've been having, which has been completely still, those wind turbines don't turn either. Yeah. So you think this is a, a big uh, waste of investment, a a risk for New Zealand in just in terms of uh, you know security of our energy. What about um, what about the devil's dilemma, the choice between national who wants to borrow money from the CCP and Labour who yeah. wants to um, let these globalist countries uh, companies into our country. You know, do we want either well, of those things? Well, it's actually quite interesting. You know, since Tuesday I've been thinking about this. We've got billions of dollars coming from BlackRock. Now, excuse me for thinking about it, but if someone arranges a loan for a big amount of money, there's a, there's a commission to be paid and there's interest to be paid. Now, make no mistake, BlackRock isn't our chum and neither is China. Neither of these countries are New Zealand's chum and uh, they all want their pound of flesh. I'm just asking, what's BlackRock's pound of flesh? Surely they're not going to give us discount interest rates, are they? Well, I don't think they do anything for nothing. I don't think they do anything for nothing either. And Cam, um, maybe you can remember, did Ardern visit BlackRock while she was still PM? She did. And and all the mainstream media ran stories about how it was all a conspiracy theory about... uh, you know, how uh, it's just, you know, this is just a meeting. There's no need to worry about it. Well, hello, we've got Jacinda Ardern meeting BlackRock on several occasions. We've got Chris Hipkins meeting Carl Schwab um, from the WEF. And then we have BlackRock tipping up here, uh, you know, handing out gifts, you know, with a smile on their face. These things don't happen in isolation. It's not a pure coincidence. This is planned. I agree. I, I think it smells fishy. I think it smells very fishy. This, this is a heck of a lot of money, and what is the cost? And I'll tell you what I think. Right now, you know, it's the choice between the devil and the deep blue sea. At least I know with China what they want, and, you know, BlackRock, what do they want? And the other thing that gets me really hit up about this is if I was a mortgage broker – and I arranged a loan for I don't know a hundred million, let alone two billion. Yeah, I'd I'd be toasted and and fated, and and I'd get a nice commission. Where's all that money going? It smells well, of fish to me. Looks like a fish, and it's certainly fishy. Well, the other thing too is at least the Chinese buy our milk products. Exactly. Not sure what BlackRock's going to uh, buy from us, other than our country. Well, I feel um, very disturbed that we've got two major parties who are succumbing to a a globalist agenda, and I'm not sure that that's best for New Zealand. I think that there are better things that we can do locally, and I think let's just remember about this $2 billion decarbonisation investment that Labor's calling you know, first in the world. We're talking New Zealand. New Zealand produced five-eighths or four-fifths of stuff all carbon dioxide. In fact, we produce so little carbon dioxide, it doesn't even register on the world scale. 
And what are we trying to do? We're trying to beggar ourselves to foreign interests in order to do what? To reduce stuff all carbon dioxide to next to stuff all? And, yes. and, and we're going to beggar ourselves by doing the one thing that has made society cheap energy. So they're going to look at energy and say, gosh, I'll tell you what, let's invest $2 billion at massive interest rates and um, we'll get that back from Joe Consumer and I bet you dollars to donuts, our energy bills won't be cheaper. We just need to look around the world to see what's happened in other countries. It's not rocket science, is it, Miles? It's not, and I feel particularly aggrieved um, that I can't see what BlackRock's end game is. I think, you know, at least the Chinese are honest and open with their end game. Yeah, they buy yeah. our products. Well, they buy domination. our products. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. The Chinese and, are honest about it, at least. They're telling us they want world domination. BlackRock says, oh, we're here to help you. It's a little bit like the government tipping up at your front door and saying, hi, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. <laughs> well, I'm deeply suspicious, and I think that this is what you um, can call a move that has happened and been organised by the last Labour leader, Ardern, and I think it's being announced by Hipkins to somehow prove that Hipkins has got holier-than-thou in a climate crisis. And from where I stand, looking at carbon dioxide, we actually need to produce cheap food. We need to we need to produce cheap energy, and Hipkins saying, "Oh, overseas companies won't buy from us unless we've got less carbon footprint." Rubbish. I I call that rubbish. If our goods are high quality and cheap, people will buy it. And you can laugh all you like at me, but just look at China and India. Their carbon footprint looks like a mammoth has sat in it, and uh, People are still buying their goods. They're not going, oh, golly, um, I'm not going to buy a Chinese gadget because, uh, you know, they've got a huge carbon footprint in their commissioning coal-powered fire stations like it's going out of fashion. Yeah. Oh, what I'll do is I'll buy an overpriced New Zealand good. I mean, come on, who does that? Nobody uh, does that. Well, well, the owners of AliExpress and Timu would um, uh, back your analysis on that. I think they would. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm talking to Joe Average in the street and I ask what concerns them the most, it's the price of their energy. I mean, I'm concerned about the price of petrol. I'm concerned about the price of power. And here we have a Labor government promising to spend a lot of borrowed money, which comes with an interest rate. And, and as we all know, interest rates go up. And Joe Average consumer is going to have to foot the bill for all these expensive um, plans that Labor has announced. And I don't think it's right. And then meantime, we've got, you know, 30 centimetres of uh, global boiling tipping down on the South Island as we speak. Yeah, and um, those poor South Islanders will be uh, stoking up their wood fires and hoping that their hydro is still um, pumping so that they can get cheap energy. Yeah. I mean, if it was me, if I was in charge, I'd say no to all the climate change. I'd throw it all out. I'd spend the money locally in New Zealand. I'd reduce all of these climate charges on petrol, on electricity. I'd make things more affordable. Well, right now, we as a country need affordable energy. We don't need renewable energy. Our energy is pretty clean. And as I mentioned before, five-eighths or four-fifths of stuff all carbon dioxide produced by New Zealand, we don't need to be the first in the world. People will buy our product if it's high quality and it's a reasonable price. To hell with climate change. Well, I'm, I'm with you on that, Miles, and that's why you're one of my buddies because uh, you – and all the others keep me grounded in knowing what the man on the street thinks. Thanks so much for calling into Cam's Buddies. Appreciate it. Thank you, Cam. Have a good day.
I will. Thank you. Good afternoon, Greg, from Wintry, Queenstown. How are you? <laughs> Good, I can. How are you, Mark? Yeah, what's happening? Yeah, it's, it's a bit chilly. We've got a lot of this uh, global, uh, what do they call it now, global boiling happening, falling on top of Queenstown, all the snow that you've got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just global boiling there. It's just snow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we call it snow, but they call it you know, global boiling. <clears throat> so what's happening, Mark? Well, you might have seen on Tuesday, uh, Chris Hipkins launched a new climate infrastructure and climate research fund with $2 billion of money from BlackRock. I'm just wondering what you thought about that. Well, here's the funny thing, and some of my friends from the the website, the bfd.co.nz, may be surprised to have this, but it's a $2 billion fund to deal with these things. I actually think it's a good idea. Let's develop new uh, electricity generation, new environmental programs. Totally agree with it. Um, the annoying thing is, and not one single member of the mainstream media or anybody else has picked up on one simple point. It's this fund from the BlackRock Investment Group, it's not a donation to New Zealand. They're not giving it to us. It's a, it's a loan fund which we can borrow against, and then we need to pay back with interest. And BlackRock don't do anything for nothing, do they? Exactly. Um, and Mr. Hipkins, in his usual obtuse manner, completely completely glossed over that simple fact. They're not giving it to us. They're giving it to us free of charge. It's a commercial loan, the same as it is. What's, what's worse, Greg, um, CCP cash from Christopher Luxon or BlackRock cash from Chris Hipkins? Uh, that's a hard one to pick, to be honest. Um, it, it makes the CCP buy stuff off us. Hipkins lot does. So... <laughs> them, to be honest, yeah. Yeah, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe we best avoid both of those. A uh, hundred years ago, we didn't need either of them. So why do we now? You know <laughs> exactly. Hey, look, thanks for your uh, comments there, Greg. Appreciate you calling into Cam's buddies. Good right. thanks for having me, Cam. See you, mate. See you, mate. Good afternoon, Jack. Welcome to Cam's buddies. Cam, how are you? I'm great. How's the flying been? Well, there's never enough of it. The weather keeps closing in on us every day, but it is getting better. <laughs> well, other things that are closing in on us, I don't know if you saw the news, but on Tuesday, uh, Chris Hipkins announced that um, he was going to create this new uh, climate infrastructure and investment fund together with BlackRock. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I thought, once again, I see 100%. Um, aiming for a hundred percent, wanting to be first in the world. Um, it's a little bit like the zero percent for the um, road toll. And I think grandiose ideas, lovely ideas. We wish they could come true, but unfortunately, no. I mean, I've had my company for fifty years, and I'm the first in the world several times until some wise soul told me. I think back in the eighties. Stop being first. You won't make any money being first. Come second or third. You'll learn from the others and it'll work better. Anyway, it's just a thought. Um, <laughs> so I, what do you I, reckon is a better option for us? Is it is it Chinese cash from the CCP like Christopher Luxon wants? Or is it one of these big globalist uh, trillion-dollar companies that we should be um, you know, uh, selling our assets to? Well, before we do any of that, um, all this philosophical stuff about being self-sustainable. Um, in 1968-69, I was a civil engineer, instrument man, they call us, working for the Utah Construction and Mining Company at West Arm Manapuri. Yeah. Um, largest construction of its type in the world at the time, thanks to Muldoon and Bill Birch, who actually are the ones that I know the Muldoon's sort of... Um, not thought of very well, but by me, he is. 
He was the one that actually gave us the energy we've got now. Uh, people need to stop and think about that. But anyway, that was curtailed. It never worked properly because right at the last moment, uh, the people of New Zealand got up and petitioned and said, oh, we mustn't raise the lake. And the whole, the whole project was based around a certain head of water and it never happened. That could change. We could actually get a whole lot more energy out of Manapuri very quickly by just going back to what they had planned in those days. Anyway, just a thought. Well, you know, engineers and, and get, generally have good solutions. You you opened the statement and said, how's the flying? How am I going to fly in my aeroplane? How am I going to um, fuel my tractor? I know these are mundane things which most people don't think about, but um, uh, aeroplanes aren't going electric anytime soon. And no. also, if it was... If it was down to me, I mean, I'd have a totally different approach. I'd open up uh, oil and uh, gas um, exploration. I'd have coal mining back in the West Coast. There's heaps of people over there that just would love to be back mining coal. Um, but that's just me. Well, Meanwhile, we import it from Indonesia and other places. Yeah, dirty, cheap coal when we've got a, a vast mountain of coal sitting under our ground and we've got oil reserves and a, heap and, of, and a heap of people that want to actually mine it. Exactly, who would love to do that. And I and I know we had a tragedy, but and that was very unfortunate. But um, they do happen. Um, but uh, I think if you ask, if you took a survey of those West Coast people, I'm sure a lot of them would say, "Yes, please, can we?" Yeah, let's keep going because uh, cheap energy um, is is yep. the key to prosperity, not these expensive boondoggles that mince birds and um, don't work when the wind doesn't blow and don't work when the sun isn't shining. And, ex and as an ex-civil engineer, I can tell you that um, I wouldn't have any New Zealand companies building anything in this country because they're <laughs> hopeless. <You> know, um, <clears throat> No, they are, seriously. I mean, I've worked for them, and I've also worked for the largest American company on the planet, and it's chalk and cheese. Yeah. Well, I don't, thank know, you. I don't know about the Chinese. I don't know whether I could trust them enough, but however. Well, the, the, a, a wise man once uh, told me that the Chinese are the world's experts at doing 80% of the job 100% of the time. Mm. Yes. And it's just that 20% that, right. that bites you. <laughs> Yep. All right, Jack, thanks very much for calling in to Cam's Buddies. Appreciate your thoughts as usual. See you later. See you. Thanks. My buddies are so helpful. They're unafraid to challenge me or my thinking. There are many times my views and reckons have been formed by these free and frank discussions. I'm going to keep this up. And if you'd like to be one of my buddies, then let us know in the comments sent to inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Would you like to be a part of Reviving Honest Media? At RCR, we're on a mission to do just that. We report on critical, censored stories and hold those in positions of power to account. As Paul Brennan says, it's a good mission. Now there's an easy way to support RCR and at the same time receive some amazing benefits. Our Foundation Membership Club is here. As a member, you'll enjoy a host of exclusive benefits, including a daily bite-sized news digest, a backstage pass to RCR, and discounted merchandise. Find out all you need to know about our Foundation membership now at www.realitycheck.radio. Our text machine is now live. Send us your thoughts by texting your message to 2057. That's 20. Five, seven. So get in touch with us now. It's time to rummage around inside the mailbag and see what little bundles of joy you've sent in to us. We've got some general feedback and questions. Great rock tune, thanks, from an anonymous commenter. Uh, regarding Sunday night's webinar, interesting comment from Cam last night referring to the hit piece by Simon Shepherd on David Seymour. If David's watching this, we'd love to get you on our show. From previous comments, I've heard both National and ACT are not that keen to appear on RCR based on allegations and attacks made on them in the past. My view on politics is different to that of most New Zealanders. In other words, if someone is more or less on your side, 
then they are on your side and it's your job to enlighten them. So to- stop attacking them and vilifying them. The government's media lapdogs are doing that, and we don't need to do their dirty work for them. Nobody has started the New Zealand Purity Party. If someone does, I'm not convinced that they'll get 50 plus percent votes in the next election. The whole truth is coming out, and sooner or later they'll admit they had it wrong because the evidence will be overwhelming. Fox News is a good example to follow. They are mostly conservative, but they do talk to a wide spectrum of people, and their popularity ratings show that. We need to give ACT and National a platform from which to spread their message without being threatened and argued with. This platform is growing, so let's get more people on board by being viewed as being fair and reasonable. And that sensible comment was from Jan. And I can just clarify a couple of things. When I was talking about uh, ACT and National not coming on the show, it was about not coming on my show. We have had some ACT uh, MPs and some National Party MPs on other shows. But this week, as you will have heard, we've had um, Mark Mitchell on. He's the first National MP to come on the show, and I welcome them even more MPs coming. Maggie suggests, thank you for giving me the opportunity to ask my questions. Liz Gunn is in the process of registering New Zealand Loyal. On her very first video, she mentions scrapping all taxes. I believe it's not feasible or possible to run the country without taxes. One can reduce the taxes and the general spending, but not cancelling all the taxes. I wonder what you think about that matter. Can you please comment? Well, Maggie, it's not something I'm an expert in, but I think that a flat tax system is probably the closest we're ever going to get to reducing taxes. But the flip side of that is that we also need to reduce general spending. Got a guest suggestion here. Judas says that we should perhaps consider talking to Mark O'Neill, the New Zealand First candidate who is standing in the Labour stronghold of Christchurch Central. Thanks for that suggestion, Judah. Regarding Brian Tamaki, definitely be having my vote. Brian walks the talk from Anonymous. Another Anonymous commenter says, hey, Cam, great interview with Brian. Also, excellent advice re-voting strategy. You may want to share with listeners that New Zealand First is committed to funding Mike King's program for mental health. Ask Winston if he would also fund Man Up. He's got the best chance of getting in but we need man up desperately. Warm regards, Sarah. Jackie says, loving the crunch. Keep up the good work, Cam. Brian Tamaki has some great ideas yesterday. I've listened to Brian and Hannah speaking in Hastings and seen their man up program in action. They are there for the people. Now, a comment about Morris Williamson. Hi, Cam. Loved your interview with Morris Williamson. Feels like we're being transported back in time to get the insider's scoop on a whole secret world. And even my 12-year-old was in fits of laughter listening to Morris relay some of the antics you got up to back in the day. Great show. Keep up the good work, Claire. Now to some comments about Don Brash. I was listening to you talk to Don Brash about GST. This is a little off topic, but at the moment, RBNZ is increasing the OCR. This is pushing the interest rates up and making the banks richer and harder for mortgage holders. Could you run past Don? What does he think about increasing KiwiSaver contributions to slow the economy? It would take money out of your pocket, slow down your spending, benefit your retirement, and you keep your money yours and not make the banks richer. Your thoughts as well. Well, Bruce, that's a good suggestion, and maybe we'll get Don back on to talk about some of those options. Now, Bronwyn says, thanks for reading out my email and taking the time to reply. No need to read this one out. Well, Bronwyn, I've caught you out. I'm reading it anyway. I just wanted to say that by the end of last week's replay, I'd figured out your thoughts, voting National Act or New Zealand First to get a change of government. And I'm very sorry I didn't follow up with another email to say so. That's okay, Bronwyn. Have enjoyed this week's replay too, especially the interview with Don Brash, and I have a much better understanding of GST now. And we've got a long comment here, very long comment. I'll have to edit some of the comments out. It's a bit, little bit sycophantic, but I get you'll get the gist of it. Hi, Cam. I don't profess to know much about politics prior to 2020. I wasn't all that interested in the subject. 
However, like many truth seekers and freedom lovers of critical thinking capabilities, I soon became very interested in the COVID Trojan horse that came along. When I was a Democracy New Zealand supporter, I bailed after the top five candidates left. I used to get annoyed with your bias for Winston Peters, and then I had a massive reality check and saw the light, in part due to your Northland poll. Like you, I am deeply concerned that with the number of minority parties and freedom community vote is so split, we're going to end up with no voice or handbrake at all in Parliament post-election. As you are well aware, this election is critical. If we don't have a strong voice in Parliament, the National Act globalist cabal puppets will continue to implement all the Marxist Orwellian ideas and legislation prepared without any opposition by Labour and worse. I agree with you that Winston and New Zealand First is the only minority party that is anti-globalist, anti-co-governance and pro-democracy capable of exceeding the 5% threshold. And then he lists a whole lot of quotes about Winston and where he stands. And he says, I've observed on social media as well as political debates within my own local freedom community, the main reasons why freedom voters say they won't vote for him. And they are, they don't trust him. He's a traitor as he went against the majority vote in 2017, choosing Labour. Although National said they would have done the COVID response harder, faster and more efficiently. So maybe he saved us from a worse fate, but who knows? They also think that he cares more about himself, his ego and career than New Zealanders. It sounds very much like every politician. And he was initially pro-jabs, mandates, mass lockdowns, even though he's now addressed that. And they blindly or ignorantly believe that their favourite will gain enough votes. Winston is far from perfect, but the reality is the other minor parties will not align or unite. Therefore, as Voters United say, we are the freedom voters, must align and vote strategically with our heads, not our hearts, if we are to succeed. He then recommends that we read an article on Gary Moller's website at garymoller.com about freedom parties and the insurmountable hurdle. He says, I applaud and admire and respect most candidates in the minority freedom parties. They got out from behind their keyboard, put themselves out for a noble and just cause, saving and restoring New, Ze New Zealand's freedoms, rights and democracy. However, they're so intent on their individual courses that they are not seeing the bigger picture or reality. They are, as you so rightly say, living on hopium. Thanks for your thoughts on how to vote on the crunch this week. I've shared this and suggested people listen to your words and experience the wisdom. It'd be great if you could turn those few minutes into a shareable soundbite. Love the political panel show and the crunch. Both provide valuable thoughts and opinions and knowledge and insights. And also the new improved version of you is a winning formula and you say you're enjoying it too. Always a bonus. Thanks to all of you for your courage, integrity, and hard work. You guys and gals make the difference. RCR is invaluable. Thanks for that long email, Tracy. I appreciate every word that you put into that. And now it's time to go and have a look at some of the socials uh, comments that are out there on the book face and the Twitter and things like that. We've got Jeanette, who says, great and informative mix of interviews, really enjoying your show. Thanks, Cam. We've got Madeline, who says, great interview with Brian Tamaki. I'm glad someone with a track record and decades of working with the community has an approach that works. What the law and order policy shows is that there are long-term changes at the forefront. We all want harsher sentences, but really the breakdown is three of the parts that make law and order working independently currently. And once they're released, it's no wonder they reoffend. We've got nothing to lose in this election is everything for my kids. I need change and I need it now as I want to have safe old New Zealand I used to know back. I will definitely be voting for Freedoms New Zealand because I know for a fact that they're doing this already and it's very successful. So it's not just a good speech like the rest of them. It's the results already being produced. With not even a cent funding from the government, currently their results so far, I can only imagine how they will do with funding. And Lisa says, awesome, I'm listening in. Hey, Cam, New Zealand First, Act and National are just as bad. None of them came out to the steps. They all co-signed an agreement form with Labour, 
to not speak to the protesters. Winston also helped get Jacinda into Parliament, and New Zealand First also helped with the publishing of the new sex education programme being pushed on to our kids. Well, that's it from the mailbag. Lots of comments there. Still not getting any negative ones. Do I have to try a little bit harder to get some of those? Anyway, I look forward to hearing from you next week. This is The Crunch with Cam Slater. Conversations with a side of controversy right here on RCR. Right, that's it for The Crunch this week. The election is approaching and the silly season is upon us. Beware of politicians making huge promises. And remember, they're making those promises with your money. It's been a real pleasure having you all back this week. I'm loving the feedback and really enjoying to talking to so many people sharing their thoughts on politics, life, and everything in between. There's plenty more in this election campaign that we need to crunch into. So a big shout out to all of you, and thank you for listening and having faith in me as we continue to explore this beautiful game of politics. And don't forget, email suggestions to inbox at realitycheck.radio for people for me to interview. And let's make this show the best political show in New Zealand. Stay tuned for a breakfast show repeat coming up next with features including money talks with my buddy Farzan Narani and Perigo's perspective with the one and only Lindsay Perigo. Look forward to having you join me again next Thursday at 4pm for The Crunch with Cam Slater. You've been listening to The Crunch with Cam Slater. Remember, you can check out the replays for today's show on our website at www.realitycheck.radio forward slash replays. Tune in every Thursday at 4 p.m. for more with Cam Slater. Right here on RCR, Reality Check Radio.